So we'll kick it off here. Um, call a meeting to order for Monday, July 6th. I'm assuming everybody had a good weekend. And now it's time to get back to business. So for the first thing we have to do always at these meetings is to approve our agenda. Is there any add-ons or changes? Yeah, I hit up uh, Carla after the agenda went out, but I would like to discuss a mask mandate for the town, similar to what Stowe's done. I've had a number of people in town ask me uh, to have the select board discuss it. Okay. Uh, looking where we could probably squeeze that in. Um, Oh, probably either bef between Blush Hill boat access and Little River road speed or right after Little River road speed, wherever. Yeah, why don't you do it after that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, those two are kind of somewhat connected. <laughs> <clears throat> All right, and I would like to just take, have a brief uh, conversation about Maple Street grant timing. Yeah. And a little bit about the uh, yeah. the road process itself, as far as what's going to happen there. Just a couple minutes on that, and then uh, <clears throat> consider, if the, if possible, a couple of skim coats over a couple other areas uh, on Guptal. Um, and then to Mike's point, there he pointed out earlier there about the whole coronavirus. Maybe at the end. I kind of put both these under manager's items there. We could just briefly talk about that a little bit and, uh, and some concerns of how everything may play out uh, <clears throat> in the fall here and uh, whether or not it'll impact us at all. Purely, most of it's probably speculation, but be nice to have a little chat about it. <clears throat> so with those, Three changes, mask ordinance, Maple Street, and coronavirus. Is there any other changes? Okay, I'll take a motion to approve the agenda as stated. I'll make the motion. I make the agenda as amended. Okay, we got two that made the motion. How about one to second? I'll second it. Katie seconds it. <clears throat> All those in favor say aye. Hi. 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 Could, could we have the folks that are on live introduce themselves? Yeah, so far we got Noah Fishman and MK Monley on and <clears throat> Mish Boreans. <laughs> you, you have to pronounce that to me. It's Boreanas. Okay. And here's Alan Thompson. And we got another one, Walter. Oh boy, is some. I thought Vienz was a bad last name, but <clears throat> Walter, how do you pronounce your last name, please? You have to unmute. Last there. name is Opazinski. Okay, I, I can only see part of it. <laughs> NSKI. Yep. It's a long one. Yep. Okay. I'm Jeremy Hill, and this is Amy Yavitz. Yep. Uh, they're coming on faster than we can keep track here. And Susan Bulmer, uh, yep. Parks Northeast Parks Regional Manager from Forest Parks and Recreation. Oh, great, great. And w Walter also works for the department. Oh, good, very good. All right, we're getting a full board here. Lisa's here as well. Hi, folks. Hadley. Okay, um, consent agenda items. Simply the minutes from June 15th and an outside consumption permit for the Smuggler's Notch Distillery. We need approval for that consent agenda. <clears throat> somebody. Would somebody make a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'll make a motion to approve the consent agenda item. Okay, Second. Mark. Katie seconds it. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Public, is there anybody here that wishes to speak at this point about anything? If not, we can 
certainly take your questions later on uh, if it pertains to any of the items on the agenda. All right, so we'll move on to the first one, which is the Bluff Hill Boat Access. And Bill was just talking about that. Yeah, so uh, this is just an update. Um, the Adamses from Bluff Hill indicated that they were interested in being they actually asked for this agenda item to be included. I don't see them here on the on the uh, Zoom, however. Um, so back a couple of meetings ago, you did amend the ordinance to restrict parking on the left side of Blush Hill Road going down toward the lake from Michigan Avenue. Um, right after you did that, that next weekend, I printed flyers and went up there myself and put flyers on the windshields of all the cars on both sides of the road, one side telling them that they were parked uh, improperly, no parking on this side, and then the cars on the other side, I put a notice telling them that you're properly parked now, but just FYI, you can't park on the other side of the street. Uh, the signs are up. And uh, as I indicated, when you adopted the ordinance, it's not enforceable until 60 days after its adoption. So it's going to be the middle of August before we can actually uh, write tickets or tow vehicles from there. The folks from the state park are on. Um, happily, I've been up a couple of different times since we adopted the ordinance after that day that I put the signs on the windshields. And uh, I went up yesterday, which was a beautiful Sunday afternoon, and there were no cars parked on the left side of the road going down the hill at all. Um, I went up there again today about one o'clock and the same thing. Everybody was on the right. Um, they were not up as far as Michigan Avenue today. Yesterday they were. But it seems like people are paying attention to the signs, and um, I'm happy about that. Uh, we have had some questions, and this is more for Susan and Walter, maybe, uh, you know, suggesting that there should be some limitations on the size of boats that use that access. And uh, I don't really know what the town's authority is. We do not own any waterfront. Uh, it's our road, but the cul-de-sac at the end of the road is actually not even ours. Um, the boat ramp probably is the old right of way to the road that used to go to Stowe before the reservoir was built. But um, I don't know if the state has ever done that or would consider it, but it's one thing that has popped up. Right now, it seems like it's working okay. And I think the fact that the center state park is open now has taken some pressure off of Blush Hill. There's another boat ramp that is uh, accessible to people now. Uh, this is Susan, if I may respond to your question, Bill. Sure. Um, so I asked Chad the same question um, because you had posed that in an email at one point in time. And um, since he, Chad Omo is the park manager for Waterbury Reservoir State Park. Well, Waterbury Reservoir, not, it's not a state park. Um, and he, he told me that he had not really seen any difference in size of boats using Blush Hill. Um, and I, and some of the boats maybe that were using Blush Hill maybe have gone over to Waterbury Center State Park. Because I know that there is some larger boats that usually go and park and use the ramp in Waterbury Center State Park. So I don't know if, I, I was hoping he was gonna be on tonight so that he could provide- Susan, I am present. Susan, oh, can you Susan. hear me? I'm <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I guess my little screen doesn't show everybody. So maybe Chad can address that a little bit more since he's on and he sees what's happening there almost every day. Yes, yeah, certainly. I apologize for coming in a bit delayed. The question about the size of boats or the number. The, the size, Chad. Uh, this is Bill. Um, you know, I've got a small fishing boat that I launched there at Blush Hill, um, you know, all summer long and spring long into the fall. I've just, earlier in the year, uh, late May and early June, I saw far more 
pontoon boats uh, than I've ever seen before trying to get in from Blush Hill and some pretty good size uh, speedboats, for lack of a better term. I don't know. I'm not a boat person, so I don't know what kind of boats they were. But I noticed earlier in the year that there was a considerable size increase. And the difficulty, of course, is the length of the trailers, which just make parking on Blush Hill that much more difficult. I see. I believe that initially there might have been more pontoon or party barges than we have now with other parks opening Lake Champlain becoming more inviting and easier. I haven't observed too many more large vessels. We certainly have more vessels, but I wouldn't say that they're necessarily in a greater length than normal. Okay. So but Chad, I agree. Yes. Um, from your perspective, is that lake starting to get crowded yet uh, for the better portion of the season, or do you think it's still reasonably? No, I, I believe we're at peak usage, and it is slightly heavier than in previous years. We can contribute that to both the pandemic and the beautiful weather we've been having, but we're definitely at peak usage now. So what, at what point does uh, consideration of some form of regulating kick in or is it just well we're at we're at peak chad but i think the question is is the reservoir too crowded at peak is it that's untenable with the number yeah. of boats out there i see no regardless of the boat launches i believe there's still adequate space for all types of vessels to spread out also note that nearly 90 percent of the users here are paddle craft so even on a busy day, if the boat launch appears quite congested, the small vessels spread out quickly on the surface. And everybody seems to be uh, pretty respectful of each other as far as boat speed and reckless yes. driving and whatnot. <laughs> yes. People come here for a reason. It's popular and everyone enjoys it. Generally, they're quite respectful. So I'm going to I'm going to date myself here, but back in 1996, 97, when there was a previous um, park manager, we did um, extensive boat counts on Waterbury Reservoir, and um, I think it was probably I don't know if it was about the same as now because we haven't really done many counts in recent years, but I know back then we talked about we meaning the public, um, the town and the Friends of Waterbury Reservoir talked about, that's when the, the use of public waters rules went into effect and the no wake zone went into effect. Um, and there was a lot of concern with a lot of traffic on the reservoir at that point in time. So it's kind of gone up and down over the years, especially when there's no water in the reservoir, it's gone down quite a bit. Um, but, you know, it takes a while for it to, I think, to increase up And this. This year is, I think unprecedented at a lot of places. We have seen way more people in general in our state parks or using the state parks um, and their behaviors seem to be a little bit unruly also, more unruly than usual. Um, Susan, I, I've got some data to add. This is, uh, this is Walter. Um, we did in 2018 do a, a user survey at the Waterbury Dam boat launch, and we had 104 respondents, uh, and we were asking questions about um, their ability to enjoy the, uh, the waters of the reservoir, how they've rated the access. Um, our rating system was out of five, and a majority of the the average for how has your experience been on the reservoir today was a 4.7. Um, how do you rate the quality of this access area? 4.6. And that, that was before the work was done. <laughs> I was really surprised. Um, and then the, the number of people that participated in the survey, we broke it out by user type. And we had of the 104, 44 people identified as paddlers and 34 identified as uh, motor boaters. 19 onshore recreators and seven said they were there swimming. Um, and that, those are the, 
I think the best stats uh, speaking to that question of, uh, I think it's just a, a good feedback loop on, you know, are we, are we at a place as far as density where it's uh, affecting the user experience? So, so it doesn't, doesn't sound like Chad or perhaps you, Walter, think that it's at a critical point yet. Um, I think one of the questions from the last meeting a couple of weeks ago was additional parking um, and whether you, Walter, or Susan could weigh in on the question of what capabilities does the state have to perhaps do some additional parking on some of the state forest land there that's, uh, I believe is on the right side of the road as you get close to the lake. Um, <clears throat> I'll take a stab and then Walter can fill in because he was, um, he took over as project lead. And of course, uh, you know, this all started with Green Mountain Power and their FERC relicensing effort back in the late nineties, um, which I was involved in. And as we were going through the the process of them developing their improving the access areas, we recognized pretty quickly that parking capacity would be quickly outstripped by what is on the ground. And um, that wasn't part of the FERC relicense licensure. And we tried to actually leverage some monies from the Land and Water Conservation Fund, which is a federal grant source, um, to match what Green Mountain Power was. Uh, using for the private dollars, using for developing the access areas, and we were turned down by the National Park Service as um, it was not, uh, it was not, um, I guess, uh, it went against the regulations for the type of funding that could be used as match. So we have identified at each of the three areas, um, uh, meaning. Blush Hill, Waterbury Dam, and the Moscow access uh, additional parking uh, places uh, and have gone through some preliminary designs and engineering for those. And um, of course, everything takes money. So uh, it, it, it has not received any capital funding, but I know um, our upper management is really concerned about the parking capacity there. And I think it's just a matter of time. And maybe after this, this summer, um, it might rise to the, to the pile, to the top of the pile. Um, whereas a few, few other things were critical first before, before the parking areas could be improved at uh, around Waterbury Reservoir. Well, th thank you for that, Susan. Um... <laughs> And I think to what Walter and Chad just said a few minutes ago, it's helpful, it seems, that they think that there's adequate space on the reservoir. Because, of course, if you, you create new parking uh, and the parking that's there now continues, you're, you're going to generate more traffic. There'll, there'll be more people using those accesses because they can get to them. So it's something that I think um, we should certainly talk about to make sure that, you know, how much more use can we accommodate? Uh, does it mean that we create a parking area for 25 parking spots and then erect more no parking signs along Blush Hill Road? I mean, I'm not say saying that we have to do that. I'm just saying if you put more parking in, if you don't do anything to prohibit the where it's allowed now, then you just you invite more usage and that's more traffic both on the water and on those roads to the access point. So I just think it takes careful planning. No, I, I agree with you, Bill. Um, but I think our issue is trying to alleviate people that are, like you said, parking on the road. So if if alternative parking off the road can be creative created and then signs like you said uh, no parking on the road it, you would think that would help uh right mitigate uh the amount of amount of extra people uh going to the lake but Rich, I mean, that, that'll have to be part of the state study i suspect yeah and and to me i don't you know clearly i don't live on blush hill road um i think the parking that we've restricted now is working well, 
um, as I said at the meeting. And if you can keep parking to one side only, sure it narrows down the road, but um, you know, the boaters and the trailers and everything else were negotiating the road a few weeks ago when there was parking on both sides. So it's clearly better than it was. And um, I think the access for emergency vehicles, which was the main concern getting down Blush Hill Road is uh, it's doable now, uh, you know, with with parking on both sides, uh, especially if if there was a vehicle coming up the hill and there's a fire truck trying to go down, that, that would be difficult. So um, I think it just, like you said, Chris, uh, continued discussion and planning about the future is important. All right, Michael, you wanted to say something? Yes, I did. I've been an active user of the reservoir since the 80s. And it seems like there's been a real ebb and flow, uh, you know, in different times. I think right now we're in one of these crazy ebbs, you know, because of the coronavirus, uh, increased uses of people want to get, get out outdoors. I think people are fairly <laughs> respectful. I think uh, we don't have, um, you know, you have some problems with both motor boats as well as paddle users. You have some, a few motor boats who are not that considerate of people on paddle craft and you have people on paddle craft who probably shouldn't be right smack out in the middle of the reservoir, you know, impeding people who are water skiing. I know there was a, a long meeting where we had for uh, public use, they, there was consideration of making the entire reservoir five miles per hour or, or less. I attended a lot of those meetings. And ultimately what came out of those meetings is that Waterbury is, Reservoir is really a good reservoir for multiple use. That's one of the reasons why they developed the North Arm, you know, as being five miles per hour or less to keep, you know, either slow motor boating or, or it's mostly, you know, paddle craft in, in that arm. And I think that's, done a real, you know, long, you know, process to keep voters kind of in different areas. It's just, I think we got to get through this year before we really, I think, want to want to change something because a lot of other places are not open. I think Waterbury is a good spot, both for paddle craft as well as for mo motorboats. And most of the time, you know, if anyone wants real quiet use, go there most of the time during the week and there's really not that much you know this year is probably a little bit of an exception when we've had some use but most year during the week it's it's the problem of people who want quiet use you know fourth of july weekend that's just a very difficult thing to accomplish so i think we need to before really changing anything i think see what you know the pandemic's going to happen are we seeing a long-term change you know, again, with having, you know, the the day use area, another, you know, ramp open. I think, yes, we need to see maybe because the ramps have been improved and more people are willing to take their, their ski boats and such in. But, you know, again, I think the Vermont Water Ski Associations, this is one of their prime lakes that they like to see used for tournaments and stuff. So I think we just have to take a wait and see attitude. Again, let's I, I think we need to work on parking and develop some more parking areas so we can maybe if I think the best thing is to try to segregate the people who just have a canoe kayak a place for them to park so they're not taking up the places that the people who have trailers, you know, I think that would really help aid the con in the uh, congestion. Yeah, um, this is Walter again, Michael had some really good insights there, I will say we monitoring the degree of use and understanding it is um, a high priority of ours for the reservoir. And it's something that um, this year, if our, if our funding mechanisms weren't impacted by COVID-19, our plan was to have a VYCC user survey assessment crew um, supporting the efforts to gather more data on the reservoir. And I'm hoping we can reinvigorate this program next year. We've used it the past three seasons and other locations on state land. And it's given us some really good data um, about degree of use, pressure, density. And um, what we've done so far is 
uh, general assessment of um, opportunities we have to expand the uh, overflow parking uh, for some of these primary access areas. And, and Blush Hill is, is one such area, uh, but there's also a plan, as, as, as Michael mentioned, um, you know, the separating the, 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 the user types. Um, another location where we're uh, investigating an overflow parking area is associated with Waterbury Dam. And that location has potential um, for a spot we can direct people um, to park that are accessing the remote sites overnight. Um, so it just separates out the cars that might be parked in, a, in an access location overnight. Um, you know, these are all th th these are all things that we are in the process of getting some concrete numbers so we can move things forward, as Susan mentioned, um, as far as securing the funding, securing the, the, the permits um, to, to do this work and get a little clear vision on uh, moving forward with it. And all of this stems from a general concern with increased usage being focused on water access as we move forward and as temperatures uh, gradually increase. So it, it is something that uh, uh, I, I guess I'll say again is, is a, a high priority for us to, to wrap our heads around. Walter, are the, are the campers designated to go into, because I know I saw a lot of cars parked in the canoe access up by Little River, you know, down there there seemed to be, because we got off the water fairly late and there seemed to be a ton of cars there still. Are a lot of the campers parking there and then canoeing up to their sites? Um, I, I believe that is one of the primary spots. Chad has uh, a much better understanding about the pattern for where the parking's occurring for folks that are accessing the, the, the remote sites. Um, it seems like the, the paddlers do like to enter from that, that area because it has, you know, the, the uh, the wake's a little more controlled. It has that more uh, paddler feel to it on the, the, the north end. Right. Um, so I think that's what you're seeing uh, with the car top access. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, I think it's probably time we moved on to the next agenda item. I have one last question and I'll aim it at Chad. Uh, I saw in the news this morning there that some of the beaches down in... Um, Lake Champlain beaches down there in Burlington were uh, pretty well trashed over the weekend there. People leaving their crap behind all over the place, just litter from one end to the other. Um, they packed it in, but they didn't pack it out. And I didn't know if we had any of those issues up here at the reservoir. Very few such issues, no. The Waterbury Center State Park staff controls the access and refuse there. And then on the reservoir itself, we have very little litter. Most people are respectful and leave no trace. Good for them. Good for them. Good. Oh. Okay, you have something to say, Bill, or are we all set? Nope. Okay. Nope. Uh, oh. I was Good. gonna say, I see Scott Seward's on this call. I think he's the last house on Blush Hill. I don't know if he had any mention of the changes and what he's seen since he's on the call. I didn't know if he wanted to say something. Maybe I caught him off guard. Who was that, Mark? Oh, okay. Uh, Scott, I, Scott, Scott I Stewart, he's the last house on Blush Hill. Yeah, yeah. You got anything to, you'd like to comment on, Scott? Um, nothing, nothing new that hasn't been said, but, you know, just to reiterate that, yes, this year has been a significant increase in, uh, in access at the Blush Hill launch here. Um, the new parking enforcement and the new parking signs are drastically improving things, so thank you all for that. Um, access to our driveway is significantly improved. Um, but yes, yeah, so the, the, the frequency of travel and the frequency of usage has definitely gone up this year. Um, and and yeah, we have we have tended to see uh, you know some altercations between drivers uh, of cars trying to figure out parking or navigate parking. Hopefully in the next couple of weeks, as everyone gets used to the new parking situation with the restricted access on one side, that that'll improve. But um, you know, we do have uh, we do have a nice vantage point to to hear and, and and watch everything going up and down the road. So it's it's been an interesting uh, it's been an interesting summer. Keeps you entertained, huh? That's a word for it. Yep. <laughs> Cocktails. At Thanks, Scott. Pocket night. What's that? Uh, nothing. 
Oh, I thought I heard somebody else say something there. Okay, well, um, we can jump to the other corner of the lake now and talk about Little, little River Road, uh, road speed. Apparently there's been speeding up there as well. I can't imagine that because we don't seem to have that problem anywhere else in the town. <laughs> um, so I don't know who stuck this on the agenda. I'd like to speak to it, but. Well, I'll start it off. Um, <clears throat> we've had a number of emails and calls just expressing concern about uh, the, the traffic and the speed in particular going to the state park and to the boat launch. It's kind of a perennial issue. Um, and I think this year, as we've already said, I, I suspect that the access at the uh, dam has been more heavily used this year than it's been in the past. Uh, I guess the state park is open now. And as you all know, the, the local folks anyway, um, you know, there's an enclave, there's a neighborhood there uh, right at the beginning of um, Little River Road. Uh, it used to be paved. Uh, the pavement got so bad that we turned it into a gravel road. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some people on the call tonight who live down there, I think. And if they want to have a chance to make a comment, they're certainly welcome. Yeah, so hi. This is Rob. Rob and Allison. We live at 250 Little River Road. We've been there for about 12 years now, I think. So the grand scheme of things, not that long, but for our lives, a good chunk of it. Um, we have seen, like Scott Seward was just mentioning, the amount of people going down the road and then flying back out has increased significantly because of the current situation, which we think is wonderful, you know, to watch our fellow um, Vermonters enjoying the wonderful beauty we have to offer at the reservoir. Um, and then we've got some out-of-staters now too that are enjoying it as well. But what one of the things we've seen more than anything is more people jogging, biking, walking that road than I've ever seen before, which has been a really nice thing to see because it is such a beautiful part of our community. Um, but we're seeing some ridiculous speeds. Uh, Amy, and Jeremy wrote a letter uh, that was emailed to Steve. I'm not sure if that was sent to you board members tonight, but it really summed up the entire situation that um, Allison has definitely been the squeaky wheel over the years trying to you know, get this thing figured out. And like you said before, uh, Ingrid, um, it's not unique to our road. I'm seeing Ingrid on the thing. I'm not yeah, sure. Yeah, my name is Bill. That, I'm Bill. using my wife's, oh, that my is wife's computer. All right, so. sorry. It's, it's a whole bunch of people on the screen. Yeah, my hair is a little longer than normal, too. So. <laughs> um, yeah, it's not, you. I mean, I read Front Porch Forum, and we know Guptill Road and Loomis, and we've got all the speeding roads in this town because people are really in a hurry to get to wherever they're going for some reason. But um, it's, we are so close to the road with our house, and we knew that when we bought it, and it, it wasn't as bad as it has become this year. It's just, it started in April, you know, as soon as people were trying to get out and enjoy the world around after being locked in for a little while. Um, and it just has just increased. And since the park is open, the mountain bike trails are being enjoyed more. Everybody's really in a hurry to get to have their fun, which I totally understand. And we've, you know, connected with the state police who have done a fantastic job. I, I just want to commend the work they've done over the past several months. They brought in I think they drug it out of one of their old storage units, a speed control um, sign that has done a good job for people coming down the road. And I, I think what happens is a lot of people just forget, you know, you see those signs where they flash at you. We're all guilty of it occasionally. It's like, oh shit, I'm speeding. Excuse my language, sorry, this is a town meeting. Okay. Um, but we've heard it, worse. <laughs> I'm sure. Um, but it's, you know, my kids are 12 or 11 and 14 and on bikes in the road. Uh, Amy and Jeremy have a daughter who is a similar age as my son. Um, Elena, who is also here, has a boy who is three at this point. And like, we're starting to use the road more and it's just becoming a highway that it's, it's there's going to be a tragedy at some point. And again, we found the speed sign has worked. It's helped. It'd be really nice to have some, some sort of permanent fixture there. 
like we have uh, going down Stowe Street coming off of um, Route 100 there. Uh, it would also be nice to have some seasonal speed bumps, you know, like we've seen around town here and there, they seem to help as well. I mean, when we see, you know, this Blush Hill conversation about the boats, I've seen some massive boats coming down our road this, this spring, driving 40 to 50 miles an hour. And it's just very frustrating. And I'm sure that you all, but maybe not all, but many of you have experienced the speeding issues where you live, but it's, it's, it's gotten to a point where it's, it's a massive problem. That's it. So um, I appreciate the, the concerns and I've, I've tried to respond to the emails and the front porch forum. I'm glad that you've been communicating with the state police. We've certainly uh, clued them into the, to the concerns that we've had and asked them to you know, spend some time down there. I'm glad that they were able to put this speed sign up. I'm wondering from the select board's perspective, I did talk with Bill Woodruff about you know, the, the speed bump that we have up near the post office in Waterbury Center. That's a, that's a temporary speed bump. Um, Bill is concerned that, that no speed bump really is going to be safe to put on a gravel road. There's really no way to anchor it in. That, that one up on Guptill Road has spikes that get driven down into the pavement and you know they kind of bind there, but if you just drive it into the, the gravel road as you go over it, he just thinks it's gonna you know, loosen it up and it's gonna bounce. Um, I have been thinking it might be, would, have to probably invest in them. I don't know if we have enough, but we could put some Jersey barriers up on the road to narrow the road in, in the vicinity of the uh, neighborhood there to, to make the road narrower. Um, that would cause people to have to slow down to go through. I don't think we can narrow it, so it will be a one lane road, but um, that's something that has occurred to me. I don't know if anybody has a but I'm not a traffic engineer. Um, there's, there's not a lot of ways to really slow people down there. As I said, we took the pavement out a few years ago. Frankly, the pavement probably slowed traffic down. It was so bad. That's why we took it out. It was so bumpy uh, that it was probably easier to speed on the gravel that's there now than it was on that old pavement. But, uh, you know, it's something that I've just been thinking about it. I don't know what your what your feelings are about that. Well, Katie, I see you had your hand up there. Go ahead. Yeah, a question I would have is if we narrow the road, would that make the people that are walking, biking, running, whatnot, would that make them feel safer or, or less? Because if you're having these big pontoon boats coming at you and the road is really narrow, is that is that gonna make you feel better or is that gonna make you feel worse? Well the I think the walkers and the bikers could could go behind the barriers. You know, the road's still gonna be there. You just narrow it in. And when you get to the barrier, the people who are walking can walk on the outside of the barrier toward the edge of the road. They don't have to walk through that narrow portion. So I'll put my two cents in here. Uh, it frustrates me to listen to the conversation here about these types of things. That's part of the reason why I throw my hat in the ring for a state rep this year. It seems like we're focusing on consequence rather than cause. I mean, this isn't just our problem. This is a problem probably that every town in the state faces, one, one form or another, speeding on roads, speeding on the interstate, winter driving on the interstate, you know, people recklessly driving, uh, putting other people's lives at risk. And there's a simple solution, as far as I'm concerned. You raise the fines for speeding to such a horrendous amount that you'd have to be a banker in order to pay the ticket. That way you avoid all this other nonsense. And listen, if you don't get it through your head, I mean, I don't know about you people, but when I get out on the interstate, I have a CDL. My CDL has so many restrictions to it. 
that if I if I violate something, uh, the guidelines are so much tighter than the average person that I lose my license like that. I'm out of business from a business perspective. Uh, when you get out on the interstate, it seems like people turn into Jekyll, go from Jekyll to Hyde or whatever. It's, it's, it, it really is discouraging to see how people act when they're on the road, forcing other people off the road, weaving in and out, uh, just causing for no other reason than they're impatient, selfish, disrespectful, whatever it is. And if we could get our legislative body to increase uh, speeding violations, tickets to an amount where you'd have to be a fool to speed. And if you are a fool, you'll pay the fine. And that fine not only will probably sting you so hard that you'll slow down, but it also will pay for the law enforcement's time and the justice system's time to deal with your foolishness. I really kind of wonder when we're going to start putting accountability in the laps of the people who need to be responsible for the way they act. And that's where I'm coming from. Well, the, um, the, Things on Little River Road are in the control of the select board. Uh, we have a we have a traffic ordinance that we amended for Blush Hill Road for parking. Uh, you can try to raise the speed the uh, the fines for speeding if you want. Is that in our purview? Yeah, you can. It's, I didn't. It, no, it's in your purview. But I caution you that if you uh, if you make the the fines such that a reasonable judge is going to think that they're unreasonable, they'll be thrown out. Um, you know, we well, maybe the judge ought to be sitting in on this conversation. Well, that's a different story. The, the other issue is enforcement. You know, we're paying the state police uh, $365,000 a year. We get eight hours of work out of them. And they're, they're stepping it up a little bit. They've been down there a little bit. But, you know, maybe if they write five or 10 tickets like you're talking about, word will get out. But the, I think the bigger question right now, is there a way that we can calm the speed uh, some way other than enforcement? But that imposes, that imposes problems to the good people. That's, that's what really gets under my skin. And to your point, if we had the control over that, I didn't realize that because I always thought speeding, especially like on Gupta Road, we don't even have, we have to go through a long drawn out process to get the speeding limit taken down. Um, I didn't realize that speeding tickets were in our peer purview, but it, what if we put, what if the select board, and I'm throwing this out to the select board, what if we talked about fine increases and or both being sign, signage on the road, sp speeding uh, just like they are on the interstate during the work zone, uh, fines will be doubled, fines will be tripled, whatever, whatever we think will do the job. I mean, if people are going up there to have a good time and they're also going driving down a road where other people are walking and riding and pedal biking and they're trying to have a good time, it seems unreasonable to have people putting other people's lives in danger when they're both trying to do the same thing. Uh, it's just disrespectful and, uh, and it really irks me. Um, so something we should put on the agenda for another discussion, but uh, I would like the select board to uh, consider that, you know, it's time, it's time <laughs> that we, uh, started making these people be accountable for their foolishness it's not it's not the good people's fault i think you have to be careful raising fines to the point where it disproportionately affects people uh, of a lower wealth bracket um i i don't know i'd be i'd be a little concerned about that i'd i'd want to look more than just um more enforcement and i guess my other question is is can we do an, a reverse speed bump and actually 
dig in a reverse tabletop that has a dip sign. Can you do that? Or does that go against uh, safety code of roads? Yeah, I, I asked that same question, Mark. I don't know, I don't know the answer to that. I did, I did ask whether we could uh, dig a trench across there. Just, can I jump in for a hot bud. Sure, Rob, go ahead. So Chris, I appreciate your comments. And I, I do think that higher enforcement will be great if someone was actually patrolling that road on a more frequent basis. I think the state police did a great job early on. We haven't really seen much of them in the past couple of weeks, but that's yeah. another thing. Um, we did notice that when the road is not well taken care of, it's in prime shape right now for a raceway. But as it develops the speed bumps out in front of our house naturally through divots and potholes and stuff, the, the, the people with trailers are definitely going much slower. You know, all the good people are going slower because they don't want to ruin their cars. So it's like, yeah, we might piss off a couple good people who want to get their kayaks in the water, but we're going to slow down some of those boaters driving 50 miles an hour past my house. So I like the, the, the Jersey barrier idea is interesting. I would guess that this behavior is probably not legal, but we occasionally on this road park our cars out in the road to keep cars for the, I mean, it slows people down. Um, but that's not safe either. Uh, what uh, Katie mentioned previously was, you know, if someone's riding a bike and has to squeeze in between a car and a boat going the other way, there's gonna be a problem. So I don't know, I'm, we're just looking for some creative solutions here that just tamper the speed the entire road would be awesome, but at least in front of the neighborhoods where there's young kids out playing in the road. Yeah, yeah I, mean, I think I love the idea of, of narrowing the road in a way that, that would make this helpful, but I'm not sure just watching the speed that Jersey barriers alone would do enough to slow these boats down in these big trucks that are going pretty fast. Um, so uh, Rob had mentioned the possibility maybe of a permanent miles per hour sign or maybe a few on either side of our neighborhood. Um, I live two doors down from the sprays on Little River Road. Would oh. that be possible? Because we have found that the temporary one really does work going up towards the park, but when people are leaving the park, they don't have that reminder and they're just flying home. So permanent miles per hour signs on either side, I think would be a huge boon and would do a lot to this. And it you're, wouldn't really be negatively impacting the good people. You're talking about the flashing signs, right? Yes, that tells you the speed. Yeah. So like I, one that, um, as somebody who lives off from Stowe Street, another super speedway in our little town, um, you know, every time I go downtown, I take my life in my hands, uh, just, just walking down the sidewalk because people seem to consider it a, a challenge when they turn down on the Stowe Street to, to see how fast they can get going by the time they're under the interstate. So I feel for you. I feel for you. My, my worry in this conversation is, um, and I mean, don't get me wrong, I've, I've wanted some form of, of, uh, of way to to get the idiots <laughs> that fly down that road to stop doing it. And, I, and, I, and I've wanted for a solution for that for some number of years now. My worry is that when we start putting regulations and we start changing the roadway to, um, to weed out the people who basically don't care for human life, um, where does it stop? You know, where, where do we, are we going to start altering roads to, um, to protect, uh, you know, people from getting hit? Are we going to be putting up speed bumps on every road that we have? Are we going to be putting speed enforcement on every road we have? And I just, I don't, My point, I don't know what the solution is and I don't know where to start and where to stop. So, no disrespect, Mark, but your comment about people with lower incomes. Do you think they have less of a brain that they can't recognize that if they uh, act ridiculous, they're going to pay for it? Yeah, but the point is, is that someone that's wealthy might be able to afford the fine. But if you increase the fines for someone who is of lower income, that could be a huge proportion of how they survive. So yeah, they made an error, but 
it would disproportionately affect them more than someone who's wealthy. So you have to be careful, I think, when you decide what amount of fine is. And I don't think you can make it. I understand what you're trying to achieve, but I think you have to be really careful when you when you think about um, that as a deterrent. I, I think that's why you see fines not in that in that level because people do have to travel. You know, we can sp speculate how it how it would impact people all day long until, in, you know, what harm would it do to give it a shot and try it? You might this you might find that people recognize that they're going to get hit hard if um, if they act like fools and decide not to. Um, Chris, go ahead, I don't, Mike. I don't think. Um... I'm kind of a little bit in agreement with Mark, but in a little different way. I don't think very high fines are going to be a deterrent. And for some people who tend to speed a lot, they think they could get away with it. I think it's going to be a matter of having maybe some more state police presence in some of these speedway areas to give, because people in the community no, oh, there. You know, we see right down when I travel on Guptill Road. They say, "Oh, the state police has been there," and people tend to calm down a little bit. So if they're out in, you know, they, they have to rotate around which of the speedways they're at. But especially local people that are as well speeding, they're not going to. I think Bill's idea, some traffic calming in some way, is is something that can help on, on Little River. But the problem is sometimes I know from traveling in a truck, especially when you go on a real downhill to try to keep the 25 miles per hour, especially with a trailer, sometimes can be a little difficult, even if you're trying to be, be safe. You know, and I think people, there are a lot of good people who try to do the right thing. And I would hate to, you know, have someone, if they're going 30 miles per hour, have a cop give you a ticket for four or $500. You know, I just don't think that's the right thing to do. So if I got picked up with my truck and trailer by DMV because I was going too fast down the hill, you think they're going to care? The law is that I have to do the speed limit. You're right. So, so, so what, what are you talking about, Chris, in terms of a fine level that you think is going to be? I don't know. I don't know. I'd, I'd have to see the fines. And to, Mark, uh, to Mike's point, He's talking about more police surveillance. Well, I think if you talk about all the roads that in the town of Waterbury that the police are already surveilling, along with the other thing duties that the two police officers that we have, the only way you're going to increase more police surveillance is to hire more police. Right. And then it goes right back to what I said that impacts the good people by reaching in their pocket because the cost of having those law enforcement officers around goes up. And I, I don't understand the logic or the lack of logic for not making the people accountable. I mean- Chris, you know, we wouldn't need speed limits and fines at all if people were as reasonable as you think they are. Right. The, why we have fines now is because people don't pay attention to the to the rules. It's always been the case. There's a lot of good people out there who speed on the interstate. There's a lot of people who go 75 miles an hour and don't think anything of it. Right. That's because we allowed it to happen. Bill, how does it work with, you know, the, the reason that this, you know, this road is being traveled is for the state park. Is there, I mean, we happen to use the state police as a contracted service for police services, but say we didn't have a police force um, and we were relying on the state police, when can we kind of scream a foul and say, hey, there's this state resource that is being overused, especially this year maybe, or not overused, but just well used. Um, right. why, well, can't we, why can't we ask for more enforcement totally separate from our contract? Well, you, you can, the, but the, the challenge of course is that the state has lots of facilities in lots of places around all around the state. This this situation that we're talking about is not unique to Waterbury, and uh, you know, 
uh, no, with no disrespect to any of the state people who are still on the call, <clears throat> uh, for years, you know, Ed Steele, <clears throat> excuse me, former chairperson of the select board, advocated for a, for a long, long time for the state to pay us more money to maintain Little River Road. Um, <clears throat> we get the same per mile um, payment for a class three road that we get for every other class three road in town. The state has never done anything any, any different. So I think it's, uh, the reality is the, the, the state has facilities in towns all across the state. They're all serviced by municipal town roads. Uh, we're lucky to have the state parks that we have here. They produce a lot of business for our, for our uh, business people like yourself. So I think it goes both ways. And I, I, I think that it's not realistic to expect the state to just say, well, we're gonna step it up on Little River Road uh, because it's our park at the end of it. Do we have- Susan? What kind of signage do we have entering that residential area um, towards, I guess, uh, Rob, where you live? What kind of signs are there as you enter that, that neighborhood of the houses pretty close to the road? that warn of residents or anything like that? Or, or is it just a speed limit sign or are there additional signs? Just a speed limit sign. Speed speed limit limit signs. Signs, but we have some painted signs that have been up over the years because it's- I've seen them. We have the nice signs out. We're about to step into the not so nice signs, which won't work either, but anyway. I think Susan had a comment, Chris. She did, yeah, I see her. Go ahead, Susan. Yep, yeah. so, uh, you know, this is not, a uh, a typical situation in many of our, our state parks where there's town roads. Um, in other locations, um, the town has allowed us to put up some signs um, for our visitors. Uh, basically, they say, I can't remember verbatim, but they, they pretty much say, please slow down, drive friendly. And if the town of Waterbury would allow us to post them along Little River Road, we could, we could do that. Um, at least to, to notify people that as they're driving up the road towards the park and when they're leaving the park, that it could act as a reminder. The small tidbit, it doesn't get to enforcement and we all know that people don't really read signs that well, but um, in other locations, it has helped a little bit. And um, I can talk to park staff and have them remind people to drive, drive friendly and through the neighborhoods or on the roads well, as well. It, if you're making that offer, Susan, I think we can say we'll would accept that. Would accept one of those signs on a road. I forgot about that. Jeremy and Amy have one of those signs on their tree. We do. Yes. Yeah. We, had, we had gotten in contact. I've called the park repeatedly and asked the rangers if they could remind people when they're checking them in that there is a residential portion of the road. And so the state park people, I believe, yeah. did drop off that sign. And it's nice. It's it's it blends in. It doesn't yeah. quite. Um, there's, there's State sure. Park Brown. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I am not even sure a lot of people see it. And drive friendly is very nice, but but I think we're looking for something that speaks a little more strongly. We are worried about our our children and um, and our families and our friends. So um, so as much as we do love that sign, and we do have it in front of our house, and we appreciate it. Um, I I feel like more is probably needed. That's Bill, just opinion. Bill, can you talk a little bit? I know we um, we had made the decision at one point to put one on Guptal and then it got tied in to another project on Guptal, which like, right. is a little disappointing that we haven't been able to get that up yet. Um, I yeah, I, us too. Yeah, um, I faintly remember the price being somewhere 4,000 to 5,000 per. <clears throat> Speed. I think it's about six, Mark. Six thousand. Um, yeah. And then, how does it work in terms of? Is that a solar powered, or does that have to be powered off of a pole? Um, we have um, two solar powered ones. The one on Route 100, uh, just between Ben and Jerry's and Crossroads. That's actually our sign. The state put it up as part of the Route 100 project, but that is our sign to maintain. That's solar powered. One of the signs on uh, Stowe Street is solar powered. I think the one on the downhill side of the road is solar, solar powered. Uh, we can look into it. <clears throat> uh, clearly in the neighborhood area there, there's a lot of trees. I don't know, you know uh, whether
whether there's enough solar gain there to make those uh, work, but we, we can certainly look into that. I've noticed that the one in Stowe seems to be mobile. It, it looks very similar to the one we have on Stowe Street, but they must be moving the one around, um, I'm sure, as either on a, some kind of schedule or they're doing it off of concerns of neighbors or maybe seasonality. But I, there's one in Moscow that comes and goes. So I'm wondering if they're using it in other areas and kind yeah. of spreading, spreading it, um, you know, spreading that investment across a couple of different spots. But yeah, um, we. We can look into that as well. There's a couple of types of portable signs. Um, the one that's out on Little River now, is it on wheels? Is it a trailer mounted one? Or I haven't been down there for a while. Trailer mounted and solar. And it's right by Seth and Elena's house. And they have a lovely uh, solar installation from okay. local Okay. So there are, there are portable ones that are on uh, wheels. Uh, the Village Police used to have one of those. Um, was on Main Street down near the state complex. Uh, somebody who was not paying attention to the speed slammed into it and <laughs> um, the village police also had one that was that was a small one that could be mounted on signposts. Um, I believe it was solar. Um, and when the village police uh, disbanded, uh, because they were purchased with grant money, uh, the village had to give those away to other law enforcement agencies. We tried to keep them so the town could use it. Uh, so we can look into those as well, Mark. What about a children playing sign? Uh, those are out of favor now. The state has advised uh, towns that those kind of advisory signs uh, are a liability risk and they shouldn't be put up. We've, we took them down about 15 years ago. I can look into that to see if it's something that is uh, meets with the whatever MUTSD, the, the, the uh, sign code that we have to comply with. So I'm not sure those signs are legal any longer. Well, so far the conversation has only uh, produced one reasonable uh, idea for me outside of raising fines and I'd at some point in the future near future I'd like to at least take a look at what possibilities are there if any but um, th these uh, flashing signs seem to make at least the most financial sense and visible I, sense at this point. Um, I we, think we should look into some portable ones as right. Mark said we can uh, move it around the community and and we, we can't afford to have one on every road, that's for sure. Yeah, that's, that's uh, kind of that's kind of my life, point. What kind of life is it expected? Like the one on Stowe Street, what, what do you, if you had a best guess, 10 years or what's the? Yeah, I think that's reasonable. So $600 a year versus, you know, additional, I mean, if, if that truly is helping. Um, and I mean, hearing just that this portable one has helped just makes me think even more that maybe we need to consider that investment. Well, you know, they're, they're like everything. And I don't know if uh, Nat has gotten off. He said that he had to leave early, but yeah. I saw some of the comments that you wrote, Mark, and it's true that when you put the signs up, they have an immediate effect, but it's just like everything else. After exactly. time goes by, people get numb to them. They see them all the time and, you know, so, they're going to work for a while. And I think that may be why a portable one makes more sense. You can move it in and out and every once in a while it's fresh again in that neighborhood. Well, the one thing I'd hate to see is that we make these mediocre efforts to try to curb this problem. And then at, the, at one of these meetings, we're talking about somebody's serious injury or death as a result <laughs> of, uh, the violators continuing to violate and uh, some bad repercussions of it. It but seems it, like any solution, Chris, yeah, which is into somebody's pocket. So yeah. if, we're gonna, yeah. if we're going to uh, invest money in signs, uh, portable flashing signs, uh, that's, that's going to reach into your pocket. Uh, no, I, I'm saying that's why I would. What I'm saying is that I think coupled with the, with the signage is enforcement. 
And, you know, we may have to hire the county sheriff from time to time to, to go out and supplement what, what we have uh, with the state police. I know that costs more money, but... Uh, so tell me the logic behind hiring people to give out fines that don't even cost the co cover the cost of them pulling the person over and, and going through the process. Tell me the logic behind that. Well, there is none. You get a fine and you get points on your license, Chris. And if you get enough points, it goes up. It's, I think it's a deterrent. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to get nowhere with this. So, um, can, I, can I just add that I would like um, these people who live on this road to keep us updated? Um, and if this is like continues to be a problem, I know it has been in the past, but just like keep us informed. And if you have any ideas, just keep keep talking to us so that we know. Yeah, I wish you all the best along with everybody else that has to deal with uh, the same type of issues throughout this town and throughout the state. Um, we'll look into those signs, the portable signs and uh, take it from there, I guess, huh? Thank you. So Bill, I've seen one too that has like a strobe that flashes, I'm sure at a certain price tier. I don't know, I, I, I feel like some of those work pretty well. I don't know if it'd be annoying for the neighbors, but I feel like, you know, even if it's not just telling you your speed, but just strobing you if you've gone over a certain speed is another way to deter. Yeah. Oh, there is uh, one that, that flashes blue when you reach a certain speed over. Uh, certainly gets your attention. There's, there's, there's a sign on the Moscow Road that it, it says that you're speeding and as you go down, it even thanks you for slowing down, which is kind of a good, I think a good message, you know, because I know even good people, Chris, as maybe you don't disagree, even good people will occasionally. Well, if I get caught speeding, I expect, to, I expect to get the fine and. Uh... Yeah, I think sometimes people need a, little reminder occasionally. Yeah. So my opinion. Question. Teresa, would, Teresa, Teresa, would you have anything to say about this? You've been kind of sitting there idle and I'd like to hear from you about it there, if you don't mind. Hello. Can you hear yeah, me? I hear you. Yep. yep. Hi. Um well I I there is no easy answer. I think that's the 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 biggest issue. We, there's no one size fits all in any of these situations because you have town roads, you have state roads, um, you have roads that uh, we control, roads that we don't control. And I, you know, I think that um, I, I'm not sure that, uh, you know, raising the fines to some level that people won't be able to pay um, is really going to, um, be effective in what you want to do. Um, it's an education campaign and continual. It's continual. It's just like it's just like uh, you know trying to get people to do the right thing. Well, you can't you can't uh, can't get everybody to do the right thing. You know the governor's been trying to get everybody to wear masks, but that's not happening everywhere. Um, even when we're talking about you know potential life and death situations for some people. So um, it's it's a uh, Unfortunately, not something that I think, uh, you know, frankly, I just don't think the solution that you were thinking about, Chris, um, would be practical. But we wouldn't know until we tried, but that's not, not an option, apparently. Rob? Yes. So, yeah. one thing, I'm not sure what Vermont laws are around this, and I think I agree with Chris that a financial punishment I don't know if I necessarily agree with increasing them, but just the fact is something that definitely slows people down. We can't afford to have police everywhere. We don't want police everywhere, but we're in an age of automation and there are plenty of countries and states within our union that allow speed signs that take a picture of a license plate and you get a letter. You can't you can't avoid it. It's way better than any police officer, whether a fine is associated or not. It's like, what, what are the, the statutes around that type of control? 
it's definitely big brother. I'm not super comfortable with it, but it's one way to do it. And you don't have a police officer for it. I don't know what the laws are about that, but um, I, I recall Burlington doing that, um, particularly um, right there at the base of Main Street. And uh, I can't remember what that intersection is there, but um, right by the courthouse, that intersection down there. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm wondering, I think that they had to post um, notices that that was, that was going to happen. And then, um, you know, I think that it, it, there's some notice on it, but it, fl it flashes at you and it's, it's taking your picture essentially, yes. Um, so it, um, apparently it's permissible. It sounds like it's something that's a under local control, um, but I don't know that for sure. Great way to generate some revenue in a time like we're in right now across Guptill Road, Loomis, all over this town. No, that's a terrific. That's a terrific idea, Rob. Um, and I just, you know, I th I thought that something like that probably nobody'd even want to think about doing. But uh, <laughs> well, I'm I'm not definitely sure be a deterrent. It it would definitely be a deterrent. I think it also would be uh, a lightning rod. I mean, when when the traffic lights went, the new traffic lights went in at uh, Park Row and Main Street, and there's cameras on them to help the traffic signals. Uh, my computer and phone lit up from people mad because we had to be uh, taking pictures to enforce uh, stopping at the traffic light. So I can I can look into it to see if it's legal, uh, but. I would suspect that you'll have a lot of people complaining about being big brother. Mm. I'm not saying not to do it. It wouldn't hurt my feelings. I'm just right. saying. Yeah, well. Uh, it'd be a, <clears throat> certainly a polarizing issue. And I'm not, I guess I'm not, I don't know, the advocation for it. I just, on a personal level right now, the situation we have, give up some freedoms to try to solve that. I think that's probably the best strategy, but. Anytime you drive on our interstate system, going down to New Hampshire, you, your picture's being taken. If you blow through a toll road, like you're gonna get a letter and you're gonna have to mail them back $3.50. And no one is freaking out about that. Just something to, to think about. I'm not, I'm not gonna go any further with that one. We can put it on the agenda along with uh, <clears throat> just looking at the speeding tickets just for the heck of it. Okay, um, I think we've beat this horse long enough unless somebody else has something really important. Um, we can I just want on. to say thank you to all of you for putting this on the agenda. And it's interesting to be part of the democratic process. Thank you. Yeah, we lost you a little bit there, Rob, but uh, I feel for all of you people that live on Little River because we're faced with the same thing here on Gupto and throughout the town. So we all know what we're all going through. Appreciate your time on it. Okay, mask ordinance, Mark. Yeah, I had a couple um, people from Waterbury. Thank you, Susan. Bring up um, those mask ordinance and asking that Waterbury consider a similar ordinance. Um, I believe it has to do with um, anyone who is in in the public vicinity of others um, is requiring a mask. Um, I think some of it is protecting in communities that are heavily tourist-based, which Waterbury definitely has um, out-of-state tourism that is starting to open up more and more. Um, I have restaurants in Stowe um, and we, we follow the mandate. Um, it hasn't really affected um, our ability to do business. Um, I think personally, it's probably the right thing to consider. Um, but again, I wanted to bring it up to the select board. Um, I think the one thing that is difficult as a business owner is feeling sometimes that you might have to do certain safety things that the, the state is not asking us to do and trying to create a level playing field that we, uh, you know, that all businesses are playing within that if I decide to say masks are required at my business and another business doesn't do that, am I actually putting myself at risk of, of losing some business? I don't know. Um, but I just think that 
more and more data seems to be coming out to support the use of masks. Um, I think we're seeing more and more states do it. Um, and I think we as a town should really consider doing a mandate. I don't know for what period of time, but um, I just think the safety of our, um, you know, our constituents, we need to really consider it. So I had a uh, discussion with a gal the other day who works for a business down here in town and she is somehow associated with the Lake Eden Homeowners Association. And because of the governor's uh, turn of the spigot, allowing people from out of state to come back in here under quarantine circumstances, back when that was a requirement, um, there was a gentleman that was supposedly coming out from California to visit his relatives at Eden, Lake Eden. And she spoke with this gentleman and said, if you come, you'll have to quarantine for quarantine for two weeks and you'll have to wear a mask. And he blatantly told her, I'm not doing either or. Uh, so there are certain people out there that under no circumstances, they have probably, like you said, Mark, they'll avoid your restaurant if you require masks and probably go somewhere else. Um, that's a, it's a tough, tough issue to, to deal with like the one we just talked about. Um, are you back open a hundred percent? What's your status? Uh, we're open in the reservoir restaurant and the bench restaurant. The other one's not open yet, but we are, we are requiring masks. Um, if you come in and dine or pick up takeout. I just, so is, it, is it just your employees, the staff and yourself, or are you talking to patrons as well? Patrons as well. And I actually have plenty of employees that are concerned about their safety and, you know, their family members' safety and their, you know, their, you know, small group of family members that they interact with parents and grandparents and stuff like that. Um, I did paste in uh, Stowe's mask mandate. I just found online for everyone. If you wanted to take a look at what they decided to do. It's in the... Um, how do how do people dine if they i mean can you explain that a little bit they just pull their mask down and yeah you, you just basically put your mask on until you you're seated and then if you get up to use the bathroom you have to put your mask back on if you walk in to get grab takeout you have to be wearing your mask i believe for so it's basically any public forum so it would be restaurants retail stores um i think even if you're walking down the street and you 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 know, get within six feet of someone else, you really should be wearing a mask as well. Um, I'll read this while we're sitting here, but I'd be interested to hear what the other members have to say. Mike, Katie. So did, didn't we, or did we not receive an email from a community member a couple of weeks ago about the same, um, the same topic? And then we, we kind of discussed it and, and it was, it's always that problem of how are we going to reinforce it like I also work in Stowe and what Mark just said that's what we have to do but you know I also go up on the bike path and I bring my mask with me and I wear it but not everybody I encounter is wearing it and like that's age groups from the elderly down to people having their kids in a stroller so you know I'm for it if that makes our community feel safer I mean I feel like everybody has their mask in their vehicle anyway um, but you know, how are we going to stop every person we see not, not wearing it? We can put up a sign that says, Hey, Waterbury requires that you wear a mask wherever you go in public, but how are we all with all of our jobs and whatnot going to require and stop every person we see not following that rule. Yeah. So you're right, Katie, a couple of weeks ago, this did come up and the select board at that time said, uh, we were you were concerned about how it could be enforced and decided to really take no action. That was what happened, I think, two meetings ago. Um, I just briefly looked at what Mark uh, sent to us. If you notice it, you know, it says the Stowe Promise. It says on there that wearing a mask is required by a resolution of the town of Stowe. So that is not an ordinance. 
Uh, I don't think it hurts to uh, pass a resolution such as that. Uh, Stowe has one of the electronic signs that we were just talking about on Route 100 as you enter, and it talks about the Stowe promise and wearing a mask is required. But that is not a legally enforceable ordinance. That's a resolution of the town select board in Stowe. So it's really a, a high level invitation request, if you will, asking people to wear masks. Um, I don't believe that is enforceable by any kind of fine uh, from what I briefly am able to read on there. But, um, you know, uh, it's something that if you want to consider, I don't think we, unless you want to copy exactly what Stowe has said, um, it's not anything that you can really do tonight. But I, I think this is really a resolution of the town of Stowe, and it's uh, a strong request, if you will. But I don't think anybody in Stowe can uh, find anyone if they're not wearing a mask, based on what I see here. What I, what I think happens is the businesses end up you know, wanting to follow these resolutions and so each business that I know of in Stowe, you know, follows it and, and kind of polices their own, their own space. So it ends up being policed, at least for the public spaces that are businesses pretty well. I, you know, I don't think, Katie, you have to think that we need, we as the select board would need to go around and, and police this. But I think the community as a general is already starting to, to do that with just social considerations. But I think us speaking as a, as a town and saying that masks should be worn in the presence of others, I think is something that, that I would support and, and I would hope others would as well. I kind of agree with what Bill's sentiment. Is, you know, as much as I'm very pro wearing masks and I tend to wear masks all over, but I do believe it's going to be so unenforceable. And I think the best way to really enforce it is the business community saying, you are not welcome in our business if you're not wearing a mask. And I've seen some businesses require mask usage. And I think that's the best way to get people, you know, and, and, and it, you know, some businesses may have to go the extra step, say, yes, we don't, you know, you're not welcome in our store if you don't wear a mask for your safety as well as the safety of our other customers. And, but I just find it hard to people walking around town, you know, I don't know if we're ever gonna get to the point where we're gonna have the mask police. I don't think we're gonna see, we're gonna be giving summons out for masks. I think it's more of a feel good kind of thing. And I think it's, it's, it's social pressure. I have mentioned to people, I say, you know, it's really, something that you really should think about wearing a mask, you're endangering other people. And I think if more people did that, I know a lot of people feel very uncomfortable about that because, you know, it's it's not an easy thing to do, but, you know, we have to put pressure to people who are not wearing masks. You know, I get every time I see the news and I see people on beaches, I see people in parks all not wearing masks and socially distancing. It just infuriates me. And I just think, I, I hate to pass something that's not going to, you know, it's, it's more of a feel good matter. My opinion. Teresa, you have something to say there? You turned your mic on, so. I, did, I, I didn't know if you guys use the, the little hands or not, so I'll lower my hand. <laughs> I'm, I'm used to using the hands in the legislature. Um, yes, I, I, um, I feel it's unfortunate that we don't have a statewide, um, a statewide um, mandate mandate yeah um, about this but um, I I would definitely support uh, something similar to Stowe one because we are we are a tourist destination and two I think that it's not fair to the businesses to have them just say okay this is what I'm doing for my business and for my um, my employees and the customers that come in here that it makes it more uniform and it gives the businesses and um, it feels supportive to businesses to me um, to say, you know, we're behind you. We understand um, 
the pressures that this is causing. And they're able to say, this is a town, um, you know, whatever it is, ordinance or, or, or a resolution. This is a town resolution in Waterbury and Stowe. It, there's not, it's just, it's not, uh, it's happening in more and more communities. Um, uh, so I don't, I, I would be in, I would be in support of uh, something like this. And I don't think it's, I don't think it's something speaking to, to Mike's concerns about um, enforcement. Um, I don't think it's an enforcement. Uh, I don't view it as enforcement. I, I look at this as social enforcement and the ability of business owners to say, hey, you know, our uh, select board has said, this is something that we believe is going to keep our community safer safer for you as visitors, safer for our residents, safer for our workers, um, and safer for our businesses. And I feel like it's something that um, we could do to actually support our businesses as they struggle um, through this uncertain time. Thank you. Good, Teresa. Did you want to say something? I... MK? Yes, sorry. Sorry, Don and I are dueling computers. Yeah, um, yeah, go ahead. I think it, it, having a mask ordinance is a good thing. Resolution. Resolution, not ordinance, resolution. I just think it sends a message and I like what Teresa said that then it might take some pressure off the businesses as well. But I personally don't go into a business without a mask. And if employees in the business aren't wearing masks, I walk out of the business. Um, it's, yeah, so I think I like the idea of that. Well, the Northeast Kingdom, uh, you, you wouldn't uh, you wouldn't do a business much business up there because any of the businesses you walk in up in the Northeast Kingdom uh, that I've been to, none of them wear masks. Um, they keep their distance and they've got shields up, but the majority of them they haven't uh, worn any masks. Um, so. As part of this discussion, maybe kill two birds with one stone here, I think maybe dragging this coronavirus conversation into this, because it's obviously that's what we're talking about. Um, the potential for, I guess my concern is the potential for what I would call our turn at it. Uh, we haven't had our turn at this virus impact yet. Uh, in other words, the hospitalization, the, the, the cases, and such. It has impacted our businesses and seems to impact our, you know, municipalities shut down, um, people are being furloughed. Um, and w with the spigot being opened up even more and the influx of people from out of state, I mean, it's just like it was before the pandemic. The amount of people coming in from out of state, and you know, most of them aren't quarantining. Um, I spoke to a couple that simply said, hey, we're, our area is clean. We, we, you know, we came up here and there was no more cases where we were and yada, yada, yada. But um, I think we're going to, I think we're going to get our turn at it here at some point. Um, so I'm just wondering uh, if we pass this resolution, Mark, how many businesses you think are going to be on board with it? I mean, I think a lot of people won't understand what a resolution is and they're just gonna put up a sign that says we're following what the town has requested and they'll police it. I think it's as simple as that. Um, and I think it makes a level playing field. And like you said, I do believe that um, we're not out of it and it terrifies me as a business owner. And I think a lot of other business owners and um, you know staff of those businesses are scared. A lot of them are scared even to come back to work. So I think anything as a town that we say we're with you, we understand the the potential risks that we're taking to try to do business in this in this environment. And um, you know, sometimes we're going to have to say things that as, as a town that we believe are the the right and safe thing to do. And you know, talking about the Northeast Kingdom, and you know, I, I don't believe that if if all of a sudden you say a mask mandate is in the town, I don't believe the business is going to come to a screeching halt. Some people are going to complain about wearing masks, but in the end of the day, I think we're, we're doing what we can to try to protect the community. So uh, to me, I think it, it is very reasonable to consider. I think um, it's just, 
I, I would hate to think, you know, if, if we do have any kind of outbreak in this town, you can see it similar to what, you know, the conversation surrounding Winooski and some of the other towns. Um, it could really hurt uh, our ability to, to get through this, whether it's my business or any of the other businesses, um, you know, and, and I'm here speaking as the larger business community, and I believe a lot of businesses would support this. I mean, in my um, mind, it, my mind is just boggled that I'm that we're even having this discussion because six months ago there was nothing wrong. It's just it's horrible to think that we gotta go through this. I'm sorry, somebody was starting to speak there before I talked. Um, yeah, this is Noah Noah Fishman. Go ahead. Yeah, I just want to second that that you know it is tough being in a a business owner and trying to make public health decisions. And I think the more that we can point to, I mean, we're doing, we're requiring masks at our businesses and um, it clearly seems to be the right thing to do for every business right now. And I think getting the town support that, yes, it's a town-wide ordinance. I mean, people do ask us, you know, if, if it's something we're requiring or if it's something the state's requiring and, and to be out, you kind of feel out, alone trying to mandate something that is really a public health decision and it's it's difficult and you know we have to answer to our staff to our customers and i think the more the town can show leadership the more it's going to help you know and support the rest of the businesses in town who are doing things right and you know one bad actor in this town in terms of the business or or just you know happenstance but the more we can prevent this happening a breakout in Waterbury that's going to benefit the whole town and you know we're we're fighting to survive here and I think we really need all the support we can get to keep COVID out of our town so we can keep to you know the scraps that we have left to try to get through this year to just try to sustain ourselves so I I very much support the uh the initiative here Chris yes um one of the things if uh, cause sometimes I, I just was picking up on what Noah was just saying about, uh, making public, having businesses making public health decisions. And I think that's a difficult place to put businesses in. And so one of the things that, um, I urge the select board to consider is maybe having our health officer, um, look at the, look at the stove and there are other communities that have done that and, um, and have her give us, uh, her opinion about, um, uh, from a public health perspective, since we have a public health officer, um, to um, to look at that and see if if she would recommend it. Yeah. Well, whether you want to agree with us or not, I know there's a lot of conflicting information out there as to, you know, the positives and the negatives of the masks. Um, so, I, I guess you know, it's a tough call. Um, getting people convinced to want to do it's going to be difficult, but I, I agree, Teresa. Um, we certainly could have the health officer take a look at what, what still has got in place and uh, come back to the board here, maybe for the next meeting, unless you think, Mark, that it needs to be done sooner than that. I just, I, I, I am concerned with time, of course. Um, my, my other concern is exactly what Noah is saying. When we, when, when this pandemic started, we didn't know how to point to, and a lot of us as business owners were starting to close our businesses before the state told us to. And that's a stress that I don't know how to explain, but when you have your employees and the general public saying, what are you doing still open? Why are you still open? A very similar stress is happening right now of why are you trying to do business? Are you doing the safest things possible? And one of which is requiring mask usage. So I think to Noah's point, as business owners, it's really nice to point to the town or the state and say, we're following the directive of the town and the state. Don't blame me for creating hard rules or closing the business down or trying to continue to do business. We believe the state's trying to do everything they can to protect us through its rule base. But sometimes I think communities, you're seeing it, I think Burlington might have it, but I mean, obviously Stowe felt the need to do it. And I'm sure it has to do with them knowing that they're any, entering tourist season and out of state people are coming. And as many of you are well aware, Waterbury becomes 
an, another crossroads for, for out-of-staters to come into our town. Um, and that is where my concern is, of, unlike maybe the Northeast Kingdom might not see it nearly as much as we will, but we, I mean, I see it driving around in Waterbury right now. There's plenty of out-of-state plates around. So would you think that if you pass this resolution that businesses may post on or should post on their doors that we agree with the resolution that's been put forward by the town and that, uh, you know, if you want to come in and do business, you have to have a mask. How would you structure this resolution? Bill, maybe you can speak to that. So here's a great example, right? I'm a select boardsman. I have businesses in two communities. As far as I knew, it was a rule. I didn't know, I didn't even know the definition of resolution, but I followed it as a business. I was going to do it anyways, but to me, it, it helped that. I mean, to me, just having the way to point it out, but you know, I don't really care about fines as much as just maybe the community embracing it more and having somewhere to point to. Um, but I don't know. I mean, I, I guess at this point, I understand that it, you know, it doesn't seem to have guts behind it, but I feel like if we do this, the business community will support it with signage. Um, can we require signage as a resolution or how does that work? Mark, um, I have a question in, in the resolution that I'm assuming that you may be proposing. Are you looking at mass usage just for indoor requirements or versus everything? outdoors as well i think it would just be in the presence of others um i don't know if we have to even define a spatial so presence of others you know indoor or outdoor um so it means if you're off walking by yourself you don't have to be wearing a mask but if you're about to interact with somebody you should have your mask up like you if you look at like you know the CDC requirements, you know, they talk about if you're socially distancing, especially being outside, I don't think they're requiring mask usage. And I, I'd be more apt to have something for indoor, indoor locations where COVID is much readily spread. And I think mask usage is much more needed in indoor requirements than at the outdoors. Maybe, maybe that's, I can yeah, going to I'll tell you, I'd be hard pressed to sit in an excavator all day long with a mask on. It's probably that, not going to happen. And I don't think that's what I would be proposing. I, you know, I, I really think it has to do with interaction between two people, not someone sitting there in their car or in an excavator or something like that. All right. Yeah. So this is Bill. Um, you know, if, if you wanted to simply adopt what Stowe has, solution, and just change the words to town of Waterbury. Um, I don't know, can you read what you sent, Mark? It's the print is a little blurred and small. Can you read where it says supporting local economy, economic recovery? Can you read what that says there? Is it saying the town is purchasing masks? Bill, where would I find that? Mark, if you go on to uh, try to to the chat, Mark sent a link. In the chat. The town of Stowe gave all the residents masks free. Oh. Uh, what would you do? Okay. Did I did I lose you? You still there, Bill? Yeah, I'm here. Oh, yeah, okay. they're moving. What are you What are you looking for, Doug? I was looking for that the ordinance that I'm a little computer illiterate, so you have to forgive me. It's not what I do. At the no. bottom of your screen, in the middle, there's a little bubble that says chat. Yeah, I clicked on that. Clicked on that and look over to the right. You should see the link that Mark sent in the chat room. Bill, do you want me to just read this? Promise? Yeah, if you can read that, because I can't read it. So the Stowe promise, while the world has already endured so much as a result of COVID-19, there are still many challenges to come. The long-term consequences are still uncertain. And it is also important to remember that while we are in this together, our individual experiences may, may be very different. 
As we enter this new phase of recovery, we ask the Stowe community to join us in support of what we're calling the Stowe Promise, promoting health safety. We slash I commit to following the health and safety guidelines and requirements provided by the governor of the state of Vermont and the Stowe Select Board both personally and in my business or organization, upholding community values. We slash I commit to creating a sense of belonging for all our community members supporting local economic recovery. We slash I commit to supporting local businesses and organizations by purchasing, donating local as much as possible and or by lending a helping hand to businesses that need and want it. I recognize that our local businesses and organizations need patience, understanding and the support to recover from the economic shutdown and are operating under new norms practicing respectful civic participation. We slash I commit to performing my civic responsibility and using my voice to address societal concerns in a respectful way. So the only place that says anything about masks is up in the top where it says masks are required in the presence of others, right? Correct. So what? Do it. <laughs> <laughs> That's my goal. There's a link in the chat to the actual resolution where they reference the Stowe promise and they say a little bit more about um, employees of Stowe are required and other people are encouraged. But the actual language is in the is in the chat now. Thank you. Um, close the select for resolution. Okay. All this the attorney in me, but masks are required in the presence of others is very vague. Very vague, you said, Mike? Yes. So it basically says employees must wear face coverings when in the presence of others. In the case of retail cashiers, a translucent shield or sneeze guard is acceptable in lieu of masks. Businesses and nonprofit government entities may require customers or clients to wear masks while on the premises. Yeah, because when I, when I drove through Stowe, I saw people outside sitting at tables, enjoying dinners and whatnot, and many of them didn't have masks on, uh, but then there were others who did. So it was kind of a 50-50 mix. I mean, it, it even says in here, while it's recognized that compliance is mandatory for employees, it is also recognizing that there's no enforcement mechanism requiring residents or visitors to wear face coverings. The intent is to set the example and encourage voluntary cooperation, not confrontation. Yeah. Yep. Right. Um, in the resolution itself, which is in that second post that was signed, it does say that. Um, That whereas Stowe business and community leaders have developed the Stowe promise. So I I wear a mask when I go in any business myself. Uh, I have it with me here at the office. And we have people come in now and we're in uh, presence of people around the vault. We all try to wear masks. Um, I'm not opposed to what we're doing, but that resolution says that the town of Stowe, along with the Stowe business community, generated this resolution and this promise. Are you prepared to do that? We've got, you know, one business person here, two, three business people. That was my other concern. So are we ready to do this tonight is my question. I mean. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to go to RW. Maybe that's uh, talk to Karen tomorrow and see if she believes that the community would support it. I mean, I, I believe she would um, or the, the group would. Um, if the concern is that the business community is going to push back heavily against this, but I, I really don't see that. But I, I mean, I haven't even heard that in Stowe. I feel like you know, a lot of people understand why, why these are, why these resolutions are coming out. Yeah. Yeah. yeah guys, guys like Billings Mobile who's got an influx of construction workers every morning, just piling into that place and very few of them uh, 
young guys, older guys, in and out, and just I don't know how that, how that would impact somebody like Rick financially. If uh, I mean, all his employees, his staffs got masks and they got shields up at the cashier's counter. Um, well, I mean, they're allowing people to go into restaurants and sit down at tables of under 10 people and everyone can take their mask up once they're seated. So basically they would need to wear their mask to enter Billings Mobile. And then once they sit down, they could pull their masks down as far as I know. Yeah, there's not much sitting down in, in Billings inside. They took the tables all away, but uh, I'm just talking about guys going in and getting their breakfast stuff and um, they're in and out and uh, they're not, I mean, you can count them one after another. Uh, yeah, the construction workers aren't. Uh, go ahead, Mike. I mean, I, I think if you if you wanted to um, adopt this resolution from Stowe, looking at the resolution itself, if you can find that, the first paragraph is fine. It talks about employees, which certainly have the uh, ability to control that. Whereas the CDC has advised cloth face coverings, uh, whereas the select board desires to add their voice, encouraging the community to follow the governor's executive order. If you wanted to just leave out the paragraph that says, whereas Waterbury business and community leaders have developed the Waterbury promise, I don't think we need to have the Waterbury promise. You could, you could take that, that uh, paragraph out and pass it tonight if you wanted to, and then circulate it. It's, it's doesn't not, that paragraph though have the mask in the presence of others? It's like the last sentence of it. To me, Mark, that promise is saying like if someone, if you have outdoor seating at your restaurant, and you're in the presence of fellow people, you should be wearing masks. And I think that's going to create a problem. Because I know a lot of times that's the whole idea with outdoor seating is that the idea is it's something where it's open air. It's you're going to tend to know your your fellow diners and you're going to have some reasonable trust in who you're dining with that you could not wear a mask in that situation. Plus, are you going to have a mask on and every time you take a bite, take it down to... Ah. Yeah, I, I don't think we have to get... I think people understand what they can and can't do there. I, to well, answer your question, Mark, um, the, the whereas, the second whereas says, whereas Waterbury Select Board desires to add their voice, encourage the community to follow the governor's executive order regarding COVID-19 and to promote community acceptance of the wearing of face coverings to help protect the public health and welfare um, you could incorporate, um, it also recognizes the best practice, which includes wearing a face mask in the presence of others. You could incorporate the, that last sentence of the Stowe Promise part into the paragraph above and uh, just not say the Waterbury business community leaders have developed the Stowe or the Waterbury Promise and have voted to support it. Uh, I mean, so Bill, how does social distancing play into this? Is there any um, consideration for that in this in this resolution as far as, you know, if should there be a clause in there that says if social distancing can't be achieved, um, m masks must be worn or what? <laughs> It's getting too complicated. Well, no, that, uh, you're right on track, Chris, because that's where the CDC guidelines are specifying if you so you should socially distance if masks cannot be be done. And I think that's a reasonable way to you know look at things is that socially you know social distancing will have as much of a positive effect as mask use. So is social distancing in the in the eyes of the beholder. No, social distancing is, I think, six feet or greater. I think that's very well established in uh, by CDC and you know others. Some people are taking it even farther, but I think six six feet is the the adopted standard. 
Bill's showing some frustration. What well, it just know? doesn't seem like we have consensus enough to do this tonight. And if it, I agree. The only way you can do it tonight is to basically copy with some minor modifications what Stowe has. Hmm. If we're not going to do it tonight, then Mark can reach out to RW. Yeah, that sounds like something written for the next meeting. It's just, yep. oh, it's two weeks goes by before you have this. And yeah, and I mean, I'll, I'll comment again. I have a business in Stowe, and I'm not this. This is already in place, and the biz. I I'm on the SAA board in Stowe, and it has not been a business community freakout at all. I have seen zero communications from any businesses complaining about this ordinance, and I would actually ask that we we do this tonight. I think time is of the essence. We obviously saw how quickly this pandemic spread across the entire world and anything we can do as a community. I just think weeks or months right now in terms of just um, in the environment and we're all just starting, a lot of us are just starting to open our businesses again. Katie, Mike, do you have the stomach to want to see this through tonight or would you rather I would, I don't, there are several things that bother me and as, as it sits, I would not vote, vote in the affirmative as much as I'm very pro mask usage. Katie? I mean, I'm, I would be for it if you reworded it um, to fit us and yeah, like I, I'm, I'm, I would be for it. Bill, can I just simplify it as of the resolution as wearing a face mask in the presence of others. And uh, I mean, some of this other stuff seems like we already have to follow the state mandates. Every business is following the ACCD rules governing each type of business. So really, the only thing we're really talking about is this wearing face mask in presence of others. And I mean, we're recognizing that this is you know, the compliance for mandatory for employees already exists within the ACCD guidelines. So really, it's just us as a town saying you should be wearing a mask, you know, that right now the state is not requiring customers to wear face coverings to enter businesses. I, Mark, I'd be for that if, if you would include the fact that you wear a face mask if you cannot socially distance. Right, that would make me uh, at a at a better comfort level as well. And as a time is of the essence thing, to Mark's point, we do have big tourist weekends coming up, like lacrosse weekend. Stowe, we're expecting like you know, hundreds of extra people. So, I I would agree the time is of the essence. Well, there's a big difference. I hear what Chris and and um, Mike are saying, but if you're going to stipulate wearing a mask. If you can't social distance, that's not wearing a mask. There's a big difference between what Mark is asking for, which is Waterbury asks people to wear a mask when entering uh, businesses. It's you know if you if you're going to say if you can't socially distance, well then that that's not wearing a mask. So we don't have consensus yet. Because the socially distancing takes into my concern about outdoor usage. Someone who's in one part of Dak Row Park and in another, you know, people may say, "Well, you're you're in my area," you know, even though you may be thirty feet away. And I don't want to beat a dead horse, but I I think this is more for indoor usage, and I don't I don't want this to be. I don't know. Called, called the libertarian in me. I mean, we could at least start with um, some form of wording that talks Look, about in, in, inside the businesses required. I, I think, you know, I really think you're, you're overthinking this if it's really something that you feel is important. Stowe has done this. The people in Stowe are not significantly different than the people in Waterbury. No, I agree. So if the people in Stowe have a resolution that says you wear a mask while you're in the premise, you're in the presence of others, right. 
Hmm. Not fist fights breaking out in Stowe because people are 30 feet apart and saying, hey, you're in my space. I mean, I, I really don't think that it, this resolution at the very bottom says it is recognized that the compliance is mandatory for employees. It is also recognized there is no enforcement mechanism requiring residents or visitors to wear a face covering. The intent is to set an example and to encourage voluntary cooperation. Yeah, Not that kind of fits into Mike's concern, I think, right? Yeah, it's, it's the real concern is, as, as someone said, I see a lot of people in Stowe still not wearing masks. So it's, you know, it, you know, it's a little bit of a feel good thing. You know, as much as I agree, everyone, you know, I say to some people, especially when they get in my face, I say, please six, six foot distance aside or put on a mask. And I don't care if I get dirty looks, but I think, you know, a lot of people are afraid and I don't necessarily think this is, this is gonna be, it, it's a nice step it's a nice thing, as Mark says, for enforcement for the business, because they could say, well, the select board has said this. That that part I like, that it gives a little bit of, you know, you know, power to the businesses to say, yes, the select board has done this, but the whole outdoor thing does bother me a little bit. And I I, I could see it's the unintended consequences, but you know, it doesn't. It does not say anything about outdoors here at all. There's nothing in the Stowe resolution that uses the word outdoor. It says in the presence of others. MK. Um, what's the harm? Seriously, yeah. what's the harm in just resolving this? Put this out there. I don't think there's going to be a problem. And we have about seven people who have been here two hours ready to talk about the next meeting agenda item. So I just want to put a plug in for that. I agree. I, I was You're about here. ready to say, let's put this thing forward and, and let it go where, well, let the chips fall where they may. And uh, we'll, uh, uh, we'll attempt to make a motion, but I, Bill, I might need your help with this. Um, I'll make a motion that the town of Waterbury recognizes that best practices, which include wearing a face mask in the presence of others. And while it is recognized that compliance is mandatory for employees, it is also recognized that there is no enforcement mechanism requiring residents or visitors to wear a face covering. The intent is to set an example and to encourage voluntary cooperation, not confrontation. Is there a second to that? If I second that. I can live with that more. Okay. Katie got to you first there. So Katie seconded it. No further discussion. Well, so, Bill. So Mark, what you said is very simple. It it doesn't, it's not in the form of a resolution like this stuff. Um, the option would be the Stowe resolution, take out the section where it says uh, the community leaders have developed the Stowe promise or the Waterbury promise, don't have that at all. Have everything else the same and just say, whereas the select board desires to add its voice encouraging the community to follow the governor's executive orders regarding COVID-19, to promote community acceptance of wearing a face mask, or face coverings in the presence, while in the presence of others to protect the public health and welfare. Now therefore it be resolved that employees are required to, and people entering municipal buildings are encouraged to wear face coverings or an acceptable substitute uh, and leave everything else the same. Does everyone have visibility to this? And can I just pass that as, as Bill, or can I request that we pass it as Bill described, or do I need to re try to re? I, th I think you need to amend your first motion, correct, or what, Bill? Well, he can just he can the second friend he can just say I don't want to. That's not my motion, and just okay. Accept this one instead. I'll I'll accept Bill's suggestion and with those changes. Well, either now does um, Carla does Carla have that? <laughs> absolutely not. So either Bill or Mark. I've I've got it. I'll get it from Bill. Okay. 
All right, so a motion has been made to accept Bill's version of the uh, resolution for a face mask. Is there a second? Second. Okay. No further discussion. Hearing none, all those in favor to accept the resolution, please say aye. 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 And Mark, maybe, I mean, this should be signed by the select board. Um, Carla is open for appointments. I think, you know, if some, at least three of you can get in to sign it uh, in the next, you know, would we'll probably be ready tomorrow. I'll try to write it up tonight before I go home. Uh, but Mark, maybe you could talk with Karen and once it's signed, we can get it to her and then she can maybe make copies and distribute it to the business community. Sounds good. So Mike, it was, I didn't hear from you there. Are you an A on that? No, oh, I voted yay. Okay, I can't hardly see you there in the background, so. Yeah, okay. It's dark in the room. Thank you for yeah, yeah, yeah. Throw that on the agenda and I know it took time, but I appreciate it, thank you. All right, Mark. Okay, so it's- Better Chris. It, uh, yeah, so it's, it, moving on here in time, so um, uh, the select board needs to appoint a representative for the energy plan committee. It's also, um, it wasn't put on the agenda properly and that's my fault, but um, at your last meeting, you asked for um, the pub volunteers, the, the, the energy committee is going to be comprised of a couple members of the public. Right. Board, some members of LEAP, a select board member, and a staff person. So there were two members of the public uh, that have expressed interest for appointment. Uh, Curtis Osler, and Daniel, is it, what's the name, Carla? Bedeck. Bedeck. Can you spell that? <laughs> B-E-I-B-E-C-K. I believe they both have spoken with Duncan. I know Daniel, um, Daniel has. Yeah, I know Curtis has too. Yeah. Daniel works at the University of Vermont, you said, Carla? Medical Center. At least that's what his email tag was. Okay. We, do either of the candidates have an energy background? I don't know anything about them. I don't think so. Okay, no resumes or anything. No. So we need to pick a representative from the select board and also um, nominate those Kurt Osler and Daniel. Appoint them. Appoint them, yeah. To the uh, energy plan committee. I can tell you right up front, I don't have any time as much as I wouldn't mind doing something like that, being part of that energy plan committee. I am tapped out on time, uh, personally. Sorry, can someone say again what the time commitment would be? They're going to have their first meeting in September. Um, my recommendation is that the select board would appoint Duncan to be the, the chairperson. He seems to be the uh, driving force behind this. I think he's willing to do it. Um, and then LEAP will uh, appoint some others. Um, and if the select board would be willing, um, I think the staff person who is on the committee will kind of rotate between myself and Steve Lott's speech and Bill Woodruff maybe. Um, but it, I don't know, I think the committee mark is gonna kind of set its agenda at the first meeting. I don't know how many times they're planning to meet. I, I would happy to be happy to participate. I can probably find some time in September, but not right now. Let's hope, huh? Okay. So, uh, Bill, the committee, I mean, we could appoint Duncan 
and you're assuming that the committee would be satisfied with that. Is that what I'm understanding? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So you've got four right now that we're appointing to this energy plan committee. Kurt Osler, Daniel Bedeck, Duncan McDougall as chair and Mark Fryer from the select board. Am I correct? Do they ask, should they be separate motions for the select board member, the public member, and then Duncan's chair? I think they'll be done in one. I think they can do it in one if they, I think they can do it in one motion, Carl. I, I make a motion to approve the uh, folks that were presented uh, by unanimous vote. Second. Okay, we have a motion to appoint Kurt Osler, Daniel Bedeck, Duncan McDougall as chair and Mark Fryer to the newly formed what will be the newly formed energy plan committee is uh, Katie, you seconded it. Um, any further discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Can I vote on that or do I, can I vote on myself? You can vote. Yeah, you can vote. Yeah. Is that a name, Mark? <laughs> <laughs> okay, very good. It's getting late. We're all getting tired here. I was tired before the meeting even started. Um, okay, <laughs> use of banner polls at the art against racism, for art against racism. Uh, I think this is carried over from the last meeting as well. Yeah, so I got an email from Teresa uh, last week who suggested that the people who had talked to the select board um, approached RW about the abutment of the bridge. Um, I think there was some frank conversations about the challenges of uh, working with the railroad and Teresa reached out to me and, and asked about um, some banners. Um, and I suggested that probably the select board should be made aware of it. And I also asked the uh, Rotary Club to weigh in because the Rotary Club I believe was the organization that actually uh, donated and uh, paid for the banner poles going up. They're, they're certainly a community facility now and they, they do belong to the town. Um, and I think the, well, Teresa's uh, part of the Rotary Club, she's still on. I, I, I have not heard anything uh, from them suggesting that they would not be willing to allow this. And Don and MK are here to talk about it as well, I guess. So with that introduction, I'm finished. Uh, well, thanks, Bill, and thank you to the select board uh, for having us here. Kind of, kind of being part of this meeting brings back uh, memories for me. <laughs> I, I, I can see why you're not on the board. I can see why you're not on the board anymore. <laughs> no, I do appreciate the time, and we have a variety of folks from that coalition that are here. And and simply, what we want to do is, since the the banner posts were put up to uh, advertise upcoming events, which is what it's been used for. This is a little different. This is a, a sign that's gonna support Black Lives Matter. And since it was a little different than advertising an event, we wanted to come to the board, as Bill said, and see and get your approval and endorsement of the sign. I don't know if you got a, saw a copy of it, Carla, if it came, or Bill, I Bill has sent it to you, or? A copy of it. Oh, I, oh, I, didn't. So no, the, I didn't see it. Yeah, so the proposed design is a banner that'll, you know, obviously um, go between the two posts. And it has, you know, dark green trees in the front, light, lighter green mountains with some clouds and blue sky that says, you know, Waterbury stands with Black Lives Matter. And that's what the banner looks like. I just want to be clear, it's not the, t the black and white one that you see around town and around the country. So we're looking for the uh, select board to support this as representatives of, of the community. Uh, of our greater community and uh, endorse that this flag, this banner can be put up. And in addition, we want to then continue with some other banners throughout the year. We're not sure the time frame; it could be up for a month or so and come up with another one that we would come back to the select board and let you know what that one says, et cetera. So we felt this was a quicker way to get the word out and get support 
for people of color in our community, then a mural is going to be a longer process. The, um, the banner polls as well can host more than one banner. I think there's a ability to have three there or four. Four. Um, so putting this Black Lives Matter, Matter banner up will not preclude other banners from being put up there as well. Um, just so the select board knows, I believe the, uh, the banners that advertise events are allowed up two weeks in advance of the event and they're supposed to come down right after the event is over. Uh, I'm assuming, Don, that your request is to allow this to stay up for an indefinite period of time. You're right. suggesting that maybe it will be rotated out, but it's not going to come down in, in the normal two weeks. Correct, correct. And I know, uh, Teresa, you said the, you, the Rotary is in a, did approve the use of the polls, correct? The, uh, yes, I brought this up with, uh, with Al Lewis. We didn't, we didn't have a club discussion about it, but I brought it up with our current president, President Dan McGibbon and Al Lewis, since Al, Al really was the uh, you know, mastermind behind the engineering feat of putting up the, that, that structure. And um, you know, we we all said you know this is something that uh, you know was our rotary gift to the town. Uh, you know, if there's any uh, adjustment or uh, exception made to the guidelines, and they are just guidelines, um, then we leave that up to the town. But we didn't have any problem with it. No. Uh, other people from the coalition, any other comments that you want to add? You know, I think I think just about it. I think just to summarize, I, I, I'm. Hang on, hang on, MK. Oh, Teresa, Teresa I was, Zoom. Was, I'm putting that on record. I'm being recorded. Thank you. <laughs> um, what was the question? Any <laughs> other questions or comments? Oh, that I we're still thinking about. We're still not just thinking. We're still working on the mural and going to be moving that process forward, but it is a lengthy process. And we feel like this is something that we need to get out there now. Um, our message in support of Black Lives Matter. And, um, you know, I just think it's an ongoing thing. Um, and that's, I think that's all I wanted to say. Teresa, you wanna finish? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna say, uh, just to summarize, what, what we're looking for is, uh, you know, to have the uh, banner up for an extended period of time, um, to switch it out periodically. Uh, we don't have a specific time frame, um, but with s similar messages in support of Black Lives and um, to uh, situate it such that the, the, the banner structure will still uh, be able to support three additional banners. So this banner would only be the um, the width and depth of the uh, of one banner not you know wouldn't take up more than one space Mike you look like you want to say something Chris yeah this is am I wrong but is this a big change from what we heard at the last meeting because what I heard at the last meeting I thought it was there was going to be images of like black people in history and and such and i didn't hear kind of you know much in terms of wording and it's that, that was that was the mural I, they were talking about like that was the mural they were talking right. about on the abutments mk has got some maroni here if i can right. jump in yeah, MK had her hand up first there. That's Let okay, Maroney. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Right, she's conceding to you then. Go ahead. Thank you, MK. Um, thanks again for this uh, discussion. Uh, Mike, you are correct. This is still part of that conversation. And as um, Don said earlier, I think we are still thinking about the mirror because, that because of uh, the process. Uh, we want something to go up now. So while we are still figuring out what that mirror will look like and trying to navigate through the, the, the hoops of getting that done, we want to have something immediate to, to stand up with 
what's what's really a worldwide movement right now. And so so we thought about um, doing the banner now while we still continue to have the conversation about what the mural will look like. And eventually when we are there, we will bring that back to the select board and present what that might look like. So this is not in it, this is not in lieu of the mural. It's just an yeah. adjunct to it. Correct. Okay. The the I met with the um, group to talk about um, the process that we used for the train sculpture and um, it, and you know there was some serious discussion about do we want this to be a community wide project do we want it to be you know a project I'm not talking about the banners now I'm talking about the art project um, do we want the art project to really involve a, a grassroots effort from our community where you know what's the best location for it what are the obstacles to the location what are the things that we need to look at in terms of um, fundraising it's it's a much uh, more in depth um, project um, to have something that is going to be meaningful and lasting than, um, than what we want to do in terms of having um, support for a message right now and support for the people of color in our community. So, um, so then this idea came up about the banner structure um, and the location being as you enter into the community. And uh, we thought that this could be a, uh, an interim step if you will, um, like Maroney was just speaking of, uh, to um, show uh, the community um, how we support people of color and our, the visitors to our community. Um, so that's, that's what this is about. Yeah, it's, it's not to replace the concept of artwork in the future, but realizing that that's going to take a much longer process. Thank you. Did, did we, what's the time frame for this? And does that need to be part of the, um, motion okay. I, mean, I think what what we'd be looking for is hopefully um you know you just authorizing bill to work with the committee in terms of uh it's it's handled right now by the rec department um nick is the one the rec director is the person who is usually uh approving the um requests for um for those things so i just you know we wanted to bring this because it was part of an earlier discussion and um, wanted to make you aware of it. So, I mean, if you're okay with, with Bill working on that, um, you know, with Nick and with our committee, then uh, I'm not sure, I'm not sure what motion you would need other than, other than that, and if Bill's comfortable with that. Yeah, you're, I think that, I think they can just make a motion to allow uh, the banners for this issue to be up for an indefinite period of time that's really the only change from the normal uh, routine. Right. Then, you know, we'll we'll work with you to get it up and stuff like that with Nick and, and the rest of it. And Mark, to, to answer your, further answer your question, uh, MK, well, if you guys approve this tonight, which I hope you do, and it sounds like <laughs> you will, uh, MK is going to put an application in, you know, the to put a banner up, and then we'll go forward with uh, hiring somebody to create the banner and put it up when that's done. We just didn't want to do any movement until we knew we had approval, but it'll start ASAP. I need to ask a question, maybe part of it out of ignorance. Um, Teresa, you just made a statement that kind of included the Black Lives Matter um, uh, statement and then people of color. Are you suggesting that that mean that is all inclusive? I don't. I don't purport to know everything about language I should or should not be using. So um, I'm going to defer to people who are more knowledgeable about the use of those terms than I. Yeah, because I, I thought I thought this I thought this movement was to be all inclusive and I just, I don't want people out there to be offended by feeling like they're not included in this issue. You understand? I, I understand, but I think somebody else can speak to that. Yep. I can speak to that. This is Marlena Tucker Fishman. Hi, hi Marlena. Hi. Um, Chris, your point is valid. It's, it's to be all inclusive and that's why 
we're saying Black Lives Matter because we're not included in so much. We're not included in representation in our community. When there's art displayed, I was driving through different areas of Vermont and seeing art of just white people on it, to be frank, and there's no issue with that. And to say that Black Lives Matter, if it creates an issue for someone, when it's just a plain, simple statement that's saying, yes, we matter, and the fact that we have to say that, even though it should be a given, should be more frustrating for us than for anyone else. It's not about excluding anyone else. It's about finally acknowledging that we need to be included. No, I didn't it's mean, that simple. I'm not talking about white and black people. I'm talking about Asian people or other ethnicities that so, made, maybe yeah, all those people ethnicities. are considered white or black. All those ethnicities matter, and they're not being targeted like black people. And that's why we're having to put out the reminder, a common sense reminder saying, hey, we're here and our lives matter. It's that simple. It's not to exclude anyone else. It's just to uh, restate what should be, that should not have to be stated, that our lives matter. That's it. So can I also chime in? Yep. Um, Maroney here. Um, I and um, I, I totally understand the concern, and, and I've heard this over and over again. Um, people feeling that the statement "Black Lives Matter" is a suggestion that no other lives matter, and that's not what it means at all. Um, and to the point of Asian people or other folks feeling excluded, um, they understand. And as Marlena talked, when we say "Black Lives Matter." Um, you know, we are actually trying to raise awareness, not a, a only about, so let's talk about um, the Asian community, for example. Let's look into the, 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 the killing of, uh, uh, by policemen of uh, Black people. Let's look into those numbers. So we are talking, this is not to say that no other lives matter. This is to say that, yes, all lives matter, but right now, Black lives don't matter. So all lives don't matter if Black lives don't matter. This is about being inclusive. It's not about being exclusive. This is not about dividing or pushing other races. This is about saying for so long, we are living in a society that feels, as Black people, we feel that our lives do not matter and we want them to matter. So Black lives matter means everyone's lives matter. It's not an a, a, a exclusive, it's actually an inclusive movement. I'd like to catch up with you at some point there, Maroney. I'd like you to see a video that uh, was sent to me tonight that uh, I'd, I'd be curious of your opinion of it. I would love that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Mark, you want to move forward with your... Motion? Yeah, um, I'll try to make the resolution. Sorry, did you say I did need to put a time frame on this? I apologize. Um, so I'll, I'll make a motion to allow Art Against Racism to... Uh, display a banner on the banner pole, and is there a time frame? You should just say uh, waving the the time. The waving waving a time frame for an unlimited period of time. For an unlimited period of time. That's better. Second for that. Is there a second for that? Second. Mike seconded it. Okay. Any further discussion from anybody? I really wish that we could have seen this design prior to this meeting. Pardon? I really wish we could have seen that design prior to this meeting. Oh. Also, I'll mention that um, MPA was going to get the application in. Hey, and trying to get in here. And you were going to. Design the sign. You can't really put the application in until you know when you can hang it up. There's a little bit of interruption there, Carla. Could you go through that again? Yeah, Don um, mentioned that MK can, was going to submit an can application. Can you hear me? You're not on. Can you hear me? I on. I can okay. hear you, Carla. Okay. Um, no, MK. Well, Carla was just trying to rephrase what what she had just said there because you okay, got blocked sorry. out a little bit. Go ahead, Carl. I Carla. mentioned that MK was going to submit an application for the sign, and then you were going to figure out what the sign was going to be. But you need, when you submit the application, you need, you need to know when it's going to go up. So, so Katie, is you, 
Uh, is your concern that you'd like to see what's going up first? Yeah. So go ahead, MK. I we can email. I'm I'm getting an echo. Can you mute your co computer? Whatever. Okay. Sorry. Um, so we have the design, and I'm sorry it wasn't sent to you before the meeting. I thought that was going to be done, but um, we can send it to you. I need to find it in an email, and I will do that in a minute. Um, and then um, I don't know if you want to check your email. And well, unless we're going to postpone this. No, I don't want motion well, I and uh, excuse me, Sorry. unless we're going to postpone this motion and, until a later date, pick it back up again until after the design has been sent out to everybody. Uh, it's a moot point to vote on it now. Um, I think it's being it's being put it in like, the chat link. Yeah. Say that again now. I can put it in the chat link. Okay. So if you click on it, you should be able to see it. Oh no, that just takes you to my Gmail. Forget that. Close that off. It didn't happen, MK. What's that? It didn't happen. It's not in the chat. Yeah. Okay, so hold on a minute. Let me find it. Live, oh. can you put in a chat? Yeah, just give me one minute. I'll get it in there. Okay, Thank sorry. You. So someone asked also where the banner poles are located. They're located right out in front of the municipal building. Oh, Teresa just answered that. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I think I might be able to do it now. If you hang on a second, this might work. Do the other select up. Okay, so can you click on that and do you have an image? Yep. There it I didn't is. realize it was going to be horizontal. Yeah, the banner poles go across that okay. way. Okay. Katie, does that help? That's me. Are you in mind? Sorry. You, you talk. I'm done. I'm done. I'm lost. Awesome. Okay. Do people have it yet? Yep. Can't yeah, seem to find it here. At the bottom of the chat. Yeah, I, I tried clicking on it, but it's not working for me. But I'm it's not working. I'm personally comfortable believing that you a link to a Google um, Google. Drive file too, in case that works better. <laughs> I'm comfortable with it. You have it, Katie. Why right, you're muted? Just out of curiosity, uh, is there any significance to the that I may not be getting? You're cutting in and out. I don't know what you said. Shit. Is there any significance to the colors? I'm just more curious than anything else. Or looks nice. Yeah, it's Vermont colors. I mean, it's the trees, the mountains, the blue sky, and the clouds, you know. It's, okay, I don't see any blue. Well, or white. I don't know. I don't have it right now, but. Yeah, white clouds. I was just curious if the colors had any significance. I don't know. Uh, Noah designed it. I'm not sure if he's on with us or not. 
Um, yeah, I'm here. Um, and I, my, the graphic, my graphic designer put together, it was an artistic take on bringing Vermont together with that Black Lives Matter movement. So it's nothing particular that I, that I can point to. Nice. We wanted to make it, we want to make it attractive as well, you know, to really, to, because it's going to be on the front of the town offices, we want to make something that represents our town and our, and our commitment to the, to this movement. Totally understand. Yeah, I think it looks good. Very tasteful. Well, I'm trying to get back to you guys. I can hear you, but I can't see you. So are people comfortable enough to uh, make a motion and pass it? I think the motion's been made and seconded. All right, thanks, Mark. Yeah, I was still waiting to hear from Katie. Yeah, I got it. So what's the verdict, Katie? Is this vote all up to me? I thought uh, we voted on it. No, no, no you said you wanted to see it. Are oh. you okay with it? <laughs> I received it, yes. <laughs> okay, and are you, I guess the motion's been made and seconded then, and uh, if you're happy with it, you'll vote yay. If you're not, you vote nay. So motion's been made and seconded, so uh, there's no further discussion. All those who wish to uh, approve say aye. 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 Uh, opposed? Hearing none. Motion passes. Can I, no, can I abstain? You can, yeah. Yeah. All right. So are we through this one? All right. Thank you very much. Appreciate yes, your and the time. <laughs> All right. The rest is up to you, Bill. Well, it's pretty late. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I only sent this out to you this afternoon. Um, we reviewed the budget the last meeting, I think, or maybe the meeting before that. We're through half the year. Um, everything looks about as it should at this point. Um, payroll, of course, is in the 40-ish percent range between 40 and 48 percent, a little behind the calendar because of the layoffs and the uh, uh, reduction in hours. Um, you'll see in the revenue pages on page two, uh, we did receive the $33,342 grant from the state for uh, recreation. Uh, it's a COVID grant uh, that the state provided to us, understanding that uh, recreation programs were going to be different than uh, normal so that clearly is helping uh, you know our uh, revenues so far for the recreation program about two-thirds of normal or what we anticipated we got 60,000 uh, we had budgeted 95 for rec program revenues so if you add that 33,000 to the 60 that brings us up to 93,000 for those revenues uh, our spending is probably going to be a little bit down, but certainly that was a big help to us and uh, enabled us to buy some tents and some other uh, pieces of equipment that we really needed, given the fact that we were going to be in different locations. Um, there's nothing else really that I need to point out right now. Uh, I did include in the email that we received last week an estimate from the state on the pilot payment and on the current use payment, both of which are slightly higher than uh, we budgeted, which is a good thing. But there was a caveat that, uh, you know, the legislature is coming back into session in August and they may indeed uh, still make some changes. So we're not out of the woods, but at least in terms of what the bureaucracy has right now, given the information provided by the, uh, by the state so far. Um, 
it looks like we may be whole this year as far as pilot is concerned. Uh, you know, we budgeted uh, $308,000 uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I think it was 336 that the anticipation is. So um, right now that looks good. So I'll stop there. Uh, if you have any other questions, certainly you can either ask them now or email me. Uh, I'll try to get back to you, but there's nothing um, here at present that I'm overly concerned about, except just, you know, what tax uh, revenues are going to look like. Uh, Chris, you signed a, um, a request for an extension that Dan Sweet um, filed with the state. Uh, typically, the grand list has to be filed by the middle of June. Um, he's asked for an extension. It's a two-month extension. I don't think it will go that long, uh, but we don't have a grand list yet, and um, the state really is not ready yet to uh, set an education tax rate yet. So we're still in the waiting mode as far as um, when we can set a tax rate. I don't, it doesn't seem likely to me that it will be even the next meeting. It probably will not be until August that we uh, get to set a tax rate at the earliest, I think. At that time, you know, we, we won't have any real information more in terms of our revenues because taxes are such a high component of it. <clears throat> but I think when we set the tax rate, that will be the time that we can have a discussion about whether we're going to um, think about waiving penalties and interest, whether we decide to push that decision off until later in the year. Um, but we're not ready to make that now. And uh, the, there have been a couple of uh, overtures from some significant property owners about um, uh, appealing their appraisals. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, that has to go through the process of um, Lister's meeting first and then potentially the Board of Civil Authority. So as we find more information about that, I'll keep you apprised. But uh, until Dan files that grand list, we won't really know uh, too much more. With everything snowballing in such delay there, how does that, what are the repercussions there on the, on the other end of this? Well, you've already decided that you're not going to collect taxes until November. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have one tax collection date. Uh, there's really no other repercussions at this point. It just will be that it will be later in the year before we have an idea. Mm. The normal year we have uh, a tax bill due in August and then another one due in November. And you kind of get a sense in August, you know, if you're at the uh, 98 percent collection level in August, you pretty much know it's a pretty decent year, and that's what it's going to be like in November as well. We won't have that this time, and it's just uh, we have to deal with it. Um, you know, we're borrowing a little bit. We'll be borrowing a little bit longer than normal. Um, we'll have to continue borrowing through the fall. Um, so it'll cost us probably more than we budgeted for tax anticipation borrowing. But I think a lot of those expenses like that will be offset by some of the cuts that we've made. It's really going to be the, the three big ones uh, plus the property taxes, the current use, the uh, pilot, and the forest and parks current use. Uh, and then tax collection. Those are our three big, four big revenue sources. If the, if the pilot and the current use and the forest and parks all come in, that will be a, a, a good sign. But they don't, we don't get that payment until November either. So it's going to be the last two months of the year before we really get an idea where we're going to stand going into next year. Well, maybe it's a good time to try to throw this these other agenda items into this conversation there maple street uh 
can you remind me when Maple Street, the grant is due or the decision on that? Yeah, I don't think we're gonna get the grant, but okay. we're, we're preparing to, you know, pave Maple Street. There's been, um, I know at least one culvert has been changed on Maple Street now. Uh, I'm expecting it's gonna be sometime late August, September when we pave, Chris. Um, Do you call it, recall if that's a, is that a, that's gotta be a, a reclaim, ain't it? Oh yeah. The, the condition of that road, it's going yeah, to be ground. We're going to, reclaim, right to the, we're going to do yeah. full reclamation. Yeah, it needs to. Okay. Uh, and I want, want the board to consider, and maybe you can suggest one way or another, Bill, there's two sections of road that stand out, small sections. From the end of Guptill Road, around the corner by the Zen Barn to the bridge are pretty rough shape. And then from the town shed to the split in the road between turning to go up Maple Street and over to where TJ's store, Luke Witch's store used to be. A um, couple of houses right there, the old, the old guy at place where Randy's mother lived in a, another house next to it, um, those, those poor people every time a vehicle goes through there and pounds those potholes, it's gonna be horrible for them inside the house. And I didn't know if those two places, if there's any way we could somehow squeeze enough out of the budget to skim over those two areas. Yeah. Uh, I'd ar <clears throat> I've already talked to Woody about the, the second one that you mentioned there up uh, from the post office yeah. to uh, Waterbury Center. Um, if you remember back in the spring, we talked about uh, Maple Street and if we had enough money that we'd do Howard Avenue. Right. No disrespect to Howard Avenue, but I think the stretch from the post office up uh, is much worse and it's much more highly traveled. Yeah, uh, for sure. I was hoping that we might be able to do that. And I know the section you're talking about at the Zen Barn. Um, Woody's off this week, um, and I'm mostly off this week as well. So I'll talk to him uh, next week about that. But I'm hopeful that we can do the, the one up by the post office anyway. And uh, we'll, we'll talk to ST about the other one and see what the cost is. So yeah, yeah. i to throw it into the mix. Yeah, OK. All right, that's all I had on that. So. Um, Thanks for the budget update. And um, unless anybody else has got any other business, I think we can close it out for the night. A, a very minor issue, Chris. Um, sure. I know I've been asked by a couple of people, and I'm I'm just curious. I know some people have said they've noticed that flags weren't up this year. I'm assuming it was either due to the big dig construction and or that we have, you know, our public works folks there on lower amount of hours. So that's not been a priority. What what flags are you talking about? Along, along Main Street for the 4th okay. of July. I don't think that's ever been us that has put those flags up. Oh, OK, because I know historically. Back in the day, Tony de Blasi used to do it all himself. OK. Uh, and it may the fire department may help, but um, I think with the construction that's the biggest issue probably, Mike, but I, I don't know. Yeah, I, I just, a few people have asked that. And I wondered too, because I'm so used to seeing those flags up for, you know, for 4th of July. Yep. And we didn't have a parade, so there wasn't a big motivation to do it. Right, yeah. All right, everybody else all set? Mark, you look like you wanted to, nothing to go. Motion to adjourn. Yeah, second. Thanks, Katie. <clears throat> second. Thank okay. Really good at that motion. You guys have a good week, the rest of you. Thank you. All right. All and uh, we'll get that.